Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Public Safety Committee meeting this morning. We actually have two topics on our agenda today. The first one is a briefing on the um, on the uh, Montgomery County Police Department staffing changes for Rockville and Gaithersburg cities, and that will be followed by uh, Bill 3223, the discussion on it, which is the Police Advisory Commission and Amendments, and that one was rescheduled from uh, September 18, 23. Uh, as we begin, I'm going to ask the panel who was with us uh, if they would please introduce themselves, and then I'm going to ask um, the, the committee uh, if they have anything to say, and then we're going to ask Ms. Farag if she will lead us off. If we could start with you from Rockville, please. Could you please introduce yourself? You're going to need to touch the button in front of you, Chief. Yep. Am I good? You're good. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, Council Members. Um, I am Victor Brito. I'm the Chief of Police of the City of Rockville. Good morning. I'm Mark Soroka, the Chief of Police, Gatlinsburg Police Department. Good morning. Marcus Jones, Chief of Police, Montgomery County. Good morning, Willie Parker Loan, Assistant Chief of Police, Montgomery County. And good morning, Darren Frank, Assistant Chief of Police, Montgomery County. Thank you, and all welcome. Does anybody from the committee have anything to say before we ask Ms. Farag to kick us off? No? Ms. Farag, if you would please be so kind. Good morning. Um, so about a month ago, Council became aware of a proposed county police staffing change that would shift full and primary responsibility for calls for service to the municipal police departments in Gaithersburg and Rockville cities. And obviously, Chief Brito and Chief Schroker are here today, and they can provide their perspectives on this change and answer any questions that you may have. By shifting most of the calls to the municipal departments, the county police can reassign six patrol officers from 1st District Rockville to other districts where staffing is critically low and calls for service are high. Three officers will go to 4th District Wheaton, and three will go to the 2nd District in Bethesda. So of course, the backdrop for all of this is the sworn staffing shortage in August. I was told there were 135 sworn vacancies, and today there are 176. Police must respond to calls for service. Obviously, if someone calls 911, they expect a police officer to show up. Um, the short staffing has already impacted average response times, which have increased from 8 minutes 36 seconds in 2021 to 9 minutes 20 seconds in 2022. And of that increase, field unit travel time or the police officer themselves took 41 seconds longer. And those are just averages. Um, it's not uncommon for lower priority calls to be held for several hours. And experience shows, obviously, nationally, police staffing shortages like this lead to those longer wait times for calls for service, but also to fewer crimes solved and cleared, and also um, burnout for on-duty officers who are overworked. And all of those factors can erode safety in the community. And as I stated during budget, county residents do not experience safety equally. Some neighborhoods have much more crime than others, and these safety disparities disproportionately and negatively impact lower income residents of color. So it's incumbent on the police department to deliver the police services where they're most needed, and the chief can provide an overview of how this redeployment proposal helps strengthen response where it may be needed most. However, any change like this will have impacts, um, known and unknown, and the threshold question here today is how this change will impact public safety delivery in the various parts of the county, obviously Gaithersburg City and Rockville City, but also the remaining pieces of the 6th District and the 1st District, as well as the intended benefits of upstaffing 4th District and 2nd District. The change won't address the entirety of the department's staffing challenges, and the committee may wish to return with a longer discussion about staffing and the department's plans to address these staffing deficiencies over time. Um, and part and parcel to that, um, you know, this is, this is the canary in the coal mine, in my opinion. The canary's dead, and there have been several dead canaries, and I think you know, they've really hit a staffing crisis which impacts public safety delivery to the most vulnerable residents in the county. Um, so, in my opinion, there is a need to really precisely identify what the department needs in terms of staffing and other resources. It takes 18 months to get a new police officer onto the department, so in the interim, are there other aspects that the department may be able to take? That could be shifting people within the department, it could be using IT, it could be civilianizing. And part and parcel with that, though, is once those needs are identified, to have council support for these resources and staffing needs and have a plan moving forward. 
And an example I'll give you right now is the approved FY24 operating budget has $15.5 million in laps. And that's essentially a frozen positions in the department that they can't fill this year. Historically, they've only had about $5 million in laps each year. And the department obviously won't need all of that money. They won't be able to magically just hire 150 new employees overnight. But even a portion of that $15.5 million will be difficult to restore back into the FY25 budget moving forward to help with staffing. So I'm turning it over to Chief Jones now to provide an overview of this new staffing um, redeployment plan. I've included several charts in the staff report, including staffing by district, as well as crime data and calls for service in their respective areas. Thank you very much, Ms. Frog. And as always, you did an excellent job on the packet as well as your presentation. Uh, and I did want to mention that uh, Dr. Earl Stoddard, representing the county executive, is here this morning as well. And with that, Chief, if you could please comment about what Ms. Frog has said. Absolutely. And I, and I meant to say Chief Jones. We, <laughs> we have more than one chief. I noticed a lot of heads came up when I said it's, that. Please. It's all good. I appreciate that, sir. Good morning to the committee. Um, and, um, you know, it's we've had uh, this discussion uh, for quite some time. I know in the previous Public Safety Committee uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Council Chair Katz, we had this conversation um, in regards to projection on our staffing level levels, and I I do believe if I'm if I'm correct that uh, I stated that we were approaching a staffing crisis. Um, I, that has not been something that uh, we've not been speaking of um, due to a, a variety of issues, and um, really when we talked about this a couple of years ago. We noted that the department at that time, uh, we were 20% of our department was eligible for retirement. Um, that did not include, as we were having those discussions, that did not re include those individuals who um, would go on to resign um, at a higher level than we anticipated um, over the last couple of years. That number has, uh, those numbers have begun to uh, uh, dwindle, which is good for, for our department at this point in time, um, but those are concerns nonetheless. Um, and so as, as uh, myself and the other uh, police leadership, particularly the assistant chiefs, we constantly have this conversation about um, our staffing levels on a daily, on a weekly basis primarily. Um, and we work with our district commanders as well uh, to get um, some feedback on exactly what are some of the issues that they are facing. Um, and they are facing critical uh, staffing issues um, in order to maintain the levels of service that our citizens um, expect here in Montgomery County. Um, so I want to start a little bit before I um, get to the point of where I made the decision um, that we needed to make some changes in the cities of Gaithersburg and Rockville. Um, prior to myself making that decision, um, we looked internally on, um, ex we looked at um, how we move our uh, bodies around um, within the department um, for critical uh, positions. Um, as you all are aware, there are other bureaus um, outside of the Patrol Services Bureau, which is the largest bureau, which traditionally has approximately about 700 officers in that bureau. Um, and um, when you have other positions that um, fall within the department, such as um, investigators, detectives, you have other support units um, that we have across the board, um, people must understand that the primary pool from which those individuals come from is the Patrol Services Bureau. Um, and so traditionally over the years, we have um, always let it be known that when a position that was authorized by this council um, that was to be filled in those specialized units, um, that we would automatically fill those positions without hesitation. Um, and then therefore, <coughs> without, you know, as, uh, as it was noted by Ms. Farag, when you note about how long it takes to train a, a new officer, which is you know approximately 18 months, um, that position in patrol does not get filled for quite some time. If, it, if, it's, if it's actually um, 
uh, filled at all, particularly in today's environment, because we're at a place we've never been on uh, here in Montgomery County with the numbers of vacancies that we've had. Um, so I made the decision based upon that, that all position vacancy announcements, which are these positions have to be, they are competed for in our collective bargaining agreement. That means these uh, individuals who want to become a detective, a canine officer, any specialized position, traffic officer, they have to compete for that position. Um, and that position has to, again, be opened up. Um, so I have made the decision that not all positions would be necessarily filled. It would be uh, mission centric, which means that those that are high on the mission list that we feel like we can't afford to have vacancies in those positions, those would be filled. But there will be some openings in some of our units, some of our detective units, some of our um, other specialized units. We've left some openings due to the fact of the crisis that we're having in our patrol services bureau. And until we can get to a point um, that we can actually fill the voids in some of those uh, in the in the patrol services bureau, uh, we'll maintain it. We'll maintain that course of business uh, moving forward. We have very um, distinct conversations about those needs. Um, and again, I've stated to the other bureaus um, that patrol services, in in my opinion, has been bleeding for a very long time. And now, unfortunately. Um, there's other uh, units and bureaus that are going to have to kind of share in that in that uh, pain, you may say. Um, so it's unfortunate that we have to operate this way, but this is a reality. Um, and so as we continue to move on, um, as we knew the numbers were going to increase, uh, we then began to have the discussions about um, the the Rockville and the Gaithersburg uh, uh, municipalities. Um, working with, with these two fine police departments that we worked with for many years. Um, and I uh, have the utmost respect for, uh, for the agencies that are led by uh, Chief Shroka and Chief Brito, uh, who do a fabulous job in that regard. But we really had to look at some hard facts about what was happening. And I'm going to treat uh, these two cities differently, um, mm -hmm. though we, the, the plan is very similar. Um, in the city of Rockville, we looked at um, the vast majority, from our perspective, we looked at the numbers uh, of uh, uh, calls for service that the Rockville City Police Department was being assigned versus the numbers that the first district officers um, that, that also respond um, with, co-respond with Rockville City. We looked at that, those numbers, our numbers said that 83% of the calls are being handled by the city of Rockville. Um, and then when you kind of look at the map of the city of Rockville um, and the way that our police reporting areas and our beats are assigned, it's really kind of, cons you know, it's real compact and, um, and, and it really does have the uh, ability for anyone, any officer to be able to move within those, in, within those beats. But one thing we looked at, the first district is actually, um, of all of the six districts in the county, it is the, the lowest number for uh, calls for service in the entire uh, six districts in Montgomery County. Mm. Um, and when you look at the vast majority of those calls actually occurring in the city of Rockville, it shows you again sort of the disparities of the workloads of the different districts that we, that we have. Um, so with that being said, um, we really looked at this closely. Um, we looked at those percentages, um, and we made the decision that we would, um, you know, reassign our officers in, from within those beats that were within the city of Rockville. Now, I want this to be clear. Um, we are not leaving either municipality. We are still responding to calls for service. Um, in both cities. Um, and then in this situation, with the first district, we, we figured that we could move six officers out of the first district, one per shift, to reassign them to other districts who are suffering at a higher level of vacancies. Um, and that therefore we would not 
um, be the primary responder for calls for service in the city of Rockville. Yet, if there is a 911 call in the city of Rockville, and the city of Rockville needs, they need a backup unit to respond, we have a sector officer, backup sector officers, who will respond within the city of Rockville 24 hours a day in each shift that will be able to support Rockville City. That is not changing. What is changing is the primary call for service. So, and that's not really a major change of business. Um, and I want to make sure that this is clear as well. Our communication center has always generally provided the municipalities as the first unit to actually be assigned for calls that occur within city limits. Um, but when there's units that are not available, right, then the count then it would fall back to the county who worked in those sectors to answer those calls. Now the difference here will be is that the lower um, calls for service, when I say lower, the uh, not non-emergency calls, the for example, a theft that occurred earlier, something that does not require an immediate police response. Um, that, the, that those calls would not be dispatched to Montgomery County Police because we will not have officers assigned to those within the city limits to respond to those types of calls. Um, so that, that is the, really the significant change here, is the reality that there could be and may be calls that will be held, um, which is not an uncommon practice all throughout the county. So whether we're in the third district or fourth district, um, when we don't have units available to respond to low-level calls, supervisors are, are given the option to hold those calls for service until the next unit is available to respond to that call. And that is one of the things Ms. Farag was talking about, how we see that there's, um, in some cases, um, depending upon the level of activity of any district at any given time of the day would warrant that. Um, and to make sure everyone is also clear, we, you know, over the years we've done um, studies about, um, you know, when do we have the most officers working at any one given period of time. And you will see on all of our rosters that the majority of officers who work at any given day work in the evening hours, really between three o'clock um, and um, really through nine, around nine or ten o'clock, and that's because that's your highest volume of calls for service all throughout the entire county. That's when people are generally moving the most, um, and we're having more police involved incidents that are in, that uh, that demand our services. So that again is not changing. But the reality is that we've seen, for example, the 4th District, who has been the number one district of, of vacancies, um, and that has warned us to have to make this decision um, at this point in time based upon where we are. Um, as it's also noted in Ms. Farag's um, report, she also notes about how, um, you know, we expect higher vacancies as we continue to move forward. Now, we're continuing to, you know, to try to hire um, that is, again, that's our number one objective, something that I task Assistant Chief Frank um, with on a, on a daily basis. And I, you know, we have this conversation about how many we're hiring, how many we're hiring, uh, but that's not going, we're not going to solve that problem tomorrow. And so the reality is we're dealing with what we're dealing with today, and this is why I've made the decision in this regard. Now I want to go to the city of Gaithersburg. The city of Gaithersburg is, is different. Um, in the sense of the way that the municipality, the lines are drawn um, for, for our um, deployment in the city of Gaithersburg. There are two sectors that we call, two beats um, that we call in the Paul sector that is more on the western end of Gaithersburg. You know, we, we want to talk about like over by Crown, um, over by Muddy Branch Road, um, the Kentlands as an example. Those are the general areas in which I speak of. So what we have done is we have pulled some resources, not all of them, we'll pull some resources again out of the city of Gaithersburg and move those to the Roberts sector, which is primarily Montgomery Village. 
Um, that is the vast majority of the focus um, because we've seen not only a, uh, that a vast majority of our calls in the 6th District for Montgomery County Police actually for us actually falls in Montgomery Village um, and uh, other parts of the 6th District outside of Montgomery Village. Um, so with that being said, I am reallocating, not moving any of those resources out of the 6th District. I am just moving those resources to the Robert sector. Um, again, it's the same concept that we will, that Gaithersburg City Police will be the primary responding uh, units in the city limits. Um, but should they need um, any assistance for any reason for backup safety on a 911 call, um, if they're, they don't have units available and there's a 911 call, and that's the same for both, both cities, we will be sending units there. Um, and we will still have those units um, in those sectors that can get to those calls in a timely manner. So this is the, the, the uh, this is really the, 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 the backbone of what we're doing. Um, this, is, this is the foundation in order to uh, support. I have uh, been speaking with uh, Chief Shroka and she, Chief Brito extensively. Um, and brought their staffs in in order for us to explain this plan, why we're doing what we're doing, um, and uh, and you know, and I'll let them speak for themselves. But there's been complete support and understanding about where we are, and you know, and I am as um, aware as they have been about hiring challenges, not just for Montgomery County, but for their agencies as well. And I'm very sensitive to that. Um, understanding that you know we train the vast majority of those officers they go to their uh, that are a part of their departments as well and something again um, and, and uh, just to remind and if, if you know in case the committee is not aware um, we also provide though uh, both of these municipalities um, you know have their patrol officers and some investigative units and, and small units but we provide a lot of other support to these cities, uh, to the municipalities, um, and that is to include our major crimes division uh, for, for death investigations, homicides as an example. Um, we also have our, um, you know, our special victims investigations division for child abuse type cases and the like, um, as well as um, are you know other special operations teams that will come in and support them should they need those services. Those will not change. We are readily available and able to respond to them and provide that same service as we provided to the residents of the city of Gaithersburg and the cities of, of, of Rockville. Um, but the one thing again that I just want to focus on and just note that the other districts, whether it be Silver Spring, Wheaton, um, Germantown, as an example, um, should officers not be available in those in those locations, there's no other department to fall back on. Right. Um, we are we are that agency. Versus in Gaithersburg and Rockville, again, of you know, those are those uh, uh, agencies that we can fall back on and who have done fabulous work. So I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. Um, about again, these are some of the reasons why we have made these uh, staffing changes um, moving forward. Thank you very much, Chief. I'm going to turn to Chief Brito and then we'll ask Chief Soroka, please. Well, number one, I'd like to just be very clear is that our collaboration and partnership with the Montgomery County has never been stronger. Um, Chief Jones was very frank, um, brought us in early. Um, discuss these issues um, as he eloquently said is that the staffing issues here in Montgomery County are not just you know with Montgomery County it is a regional and national issue um, that really hasn't gotten any better um, so certainly we understand uh, what uh, the Montgomery County Police Department has to do with staffing and reallocation of, of personnel for delivery of service that being said uh, it will have an impact on the city of Rockville you know um, primarily in the uh, non-priority calls for service that would ultimately, as we call in police work, they'd be stacked. Um, again, we've never faced this before, so I can't give you uh, 
an idea until we're 30, 60, 90 days or a year out, what that analysis would be. Yep. Um, but in my 35 years of law enforcement experience, I know that there will be an impact. Um, the city of Rockville works hand in hand with Montgomery County Police in a very, very uh, efficient manner. Um, we anticipate that we'll have those stacking of calls for service. Priority response, I absolutely believe the county will be there when we have a priority response. They always have been. Don't anticipate that even being an issue. Um, but the non-priority calls for service, which is for, frankly our bread and butter, you know, with the non, uh, the calls that don't need an immediate response. Um, and our community has come, uh, and we're largely a product, product of our own success. You know, we're very, very good providing that level of service and that level of concierge type of service that we do to our members of our community to respond virtually to everything that they have. Um, and I believe those non-priority calls for service will be stacked. Um, and that would, uh, that would be an issue for our city. You know, so, you know, we're looking at how we deploy our personnel. Um, you know, we've had staffing issues ourselves, and we're still grappling with those issues our, um, to this very day. Um, but there will, be a, there will be an impact. And I think it will be, um, again, I can't give you what that number would be. Um, I can just anecdotally tell you that there will be that, uh, that delay. So um, we continue um, to have that relationship with the county. And ultimately, I think in partnership with Montgomery County and, um, and all of us, that we can you know, work to you know, solving those issues. But the staffing issue is something that's not going to be solved overnight. Um, there, it's very complex, um, and uh, the pool of candidates coming into our communities, you know, for, for policing is is probably down 70, 80 percent, depending on what that may be. So we'll continue to work, but I am uh, I am grateful for Chief Jones and the Montgomery County Police to the level of service. There has not been one thing since I've been here for over five years that Chief Jones has said no to me, um, and he's always supported our agency. So. Um, I understand exactly where he's going, to, where he's going, where he has to be, uh, but uh, we're going to we're going to have to staff up to provide that level of service. And uh, as as said, is that you just don't hire a police officer like that. The hardest position in America to fill. So thank you, um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. How many Rockville City officers are there? There's 66. There's 66. We're down uh, approximately six positions, but we have about three that are uh, be, be getting continued offers right now. Um, and you know that ebb and flows. There's always an ebb sure. and flow with retirements. We just had a retirement, um, so that will change. You know um, that will change. So we've been uh, we've been fortunate is that we have very very good personnel that are coming on, whether it be laterals or they be new hires. Um, you know, obviously, you know, when we're looking at increasing our numbers, you know, hiring a lateral officer is the ideal candidate, um, a particular Maryland certified officer, so um, because I can put them into service fairly quickly. Um, uh, uh, but you know, when I have to go through an academy, as it's been said here, it's a long time. You know, from hire to actually having them fully patrol alone on the street, it's, it's a long time. You're looking at 18 months, roughly. So, um, you know, we're going to have to increase our numbers based on the data that we have uh, um, about the number of calls for service. You know, as it was said, is it's about 83% that we handle. That's a fairly recent number. Historically, it's been about 70 plus percent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, that data, um, you know, we'll continue to look at. And, uh, you know, the thing is that we're really good is in the city of Rockville, uh, we're resilient. Um, so we'll continue to provide that level of service. Thank you very much. Chief Soroka, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You're going to need to cut on your microphone. I certainly understand the challenges, mm -hmm. uh, in particular in regard to the staffing of the Montgomery County Police Department, both now as well as into the future. Um, Chief Jones has done an outstanding job explaining the purpose and uh, of the redeployment plan, and I fully understand that. How it's going to impact the residents of, of the city of Gaithersburg is, is that in 2022, the Montgomery County Police 6th District handled just over 4,200 calls in the city. We're going to, for the most part, be responsible for picking up those additional calls. Um, so as a result, uh, I'm going to have to increase staffing and the authorized strength of the department is going to have to grow. 
I have requested four additional positions which have been approved for the January um, Academy class. I fully anticipate um, having to grow the department beyond that come July of next year. Um, I don't know what those numbers are going to be yet. These are going to have to be measured and tracked to see what the unforeseen consequences are of this redeployment plan. Um, I know the residents of the city of Gaithersburg um, expect in the police service delivery uh, a prompt response. I don't think they're going to be satisfied with waiting for non-priority calls and half, a half an hour or hours um, to wait. They're not used, used to that. Um, what's a non-priority to me um, is not necessarily a non-priority to the citizen. Exactly right. For example, you have a traffic accident and you're on the side of the road, the person doesn't have insurance information, <clears throat> they're waiting on a police officer for an extended period of time, I'm, I'm going to hear about that. So the department's going to have to grow um, to keep up with the existing workload, also the anticipated increase um, in, in, the, in the work. Um, I am concerned that as the staffing of the Montgomery County Police, Chief Jones has mentioned about um, in the future, those numbers could get worse with the vacancies, which potentially could impact um, uh, priority calls and delays for priority calls. You only have so many officers, you only can spread them so many ways. Um, so at the end of the day, we're just going to have to you know, take more ownership of the city and increase the authorized staffing of the, of the department. How many Gaithersburg City officers? Do Our authorized uh, strength is 60 officers. I currently have 63. Um, we do over hires. We have an academy class there with uh, well qualified candidates that we're processing applicants for. Um, I have authorization to hire up to three additional of officers beyond our authorized strength. Um, so, with the four new positions, we already have three on the books now. Um, you have to add one, which you have a police cadet to go into the academy. So that'll put us at the new authorized staff in the 64 come January. Um, and right now, the all departments are dispatched by the county. Am I correct in that? Yes. That's correct. Yes. Except they, I'll, I'll let them answer because I think they have some other I, I thought there dispatch was an capabilities. There. Yes, there is an asterisk. Please, Chief. Yes. Sure. Chief, um, you know, the priority calls for service primarily come from the DCC through Montgomery County. We have our own non-emergency dispatch that we have 24-7. But Gaithersburg, everything comes through. Uh, That's correct. The, the I, you know, just as, a, as an aside, I, and I understand this is a change, but it's a change that should have probably come about a long time ago, candidly. Um, when I always say, when I was wearing the other uniform, when I was the mayor of Gaithersburg, it always disturbed me that here Montgomery County was dispatching uh, Gaithersburg city officers. I'm not speaking about Rockville at this moment, though, though I certainly represent both, the, uh, both municipalities proudly. Um, that the county was dispatching Gaithersburg city officers, but what the county wasn't giving any money to the city of Gaithersburg for any of those officers and we would you know, obviously complain and they'd say well we don't count your numbers you know you're you're we we have the 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 numbers for the police in your district that we would whether you existed or not there's no there's no law that says that a municipality has to have a police force in fact the vast vast majorities of uh, Montgomery of the uh, municipalities in Montgomery County don't have police force uh, forces so it always bothered me because here you're dispatching air officers but pretending they're not there. And so this does correct that. And, and I do believe that, that uh, it, it's, it's kind of ironic for a long time in, in the city of Gaithersburg, we did not have a, a uh, station in the city of Gaithersburg limits. Uh, there was one in Rockville, the city limits. But there was none in Gaithersburg. In fact, for a long time, the Rockville City, uh, uh, the one that was the the uh, the uh, station that was in Rockville City, actually handled the calls in Gaithersburg City way back when. Uh, it, but now we actually have two uh, stations in the city of Gaithersburg. One being the Rockville station that does not handle calls in the city of Gaithersburg, in the old National Geographic, your, your headquarters area. And then, of course, the one that the city got the the sixth district, and the city was very proud that we uh, were able to get the the land for the one that's being built right now for the sixth district. But 
having said all that, we need to make certain everyone is safe. And we need to make certain that, that there is no question, if there's an emergency, if someone calls 911, whether it be today or whenever this starts, that they're going to get a response as quickly as possible for an emergency call. There is no difference. The, the difference is going to be, and to the points that you have made, that, that uh, a non-emergency call, and, and to Chief Soroka's point, what the police could consider a non-emergency call, to the person who's tapping their foot saying, where are they, every second seems like a month. And so we need to make certain that we can do what we need to do, and we'll do it as quickly as we can. I also believe we need to look at, again, the tax duplication. We now, the county does give some funds for tax duplication, and especially for the police, um, for the work that the municipalities do that the county, if they didn't exist, that the counties, that the county would be doing. And so we need to make certain that our that we're being fair and reasonable and as I like to say if the municipalities are doing what we think which should be the the county's work or would have been the county's work then we need to, to pay for that as well um, with that committee members do you have anything to add please go ahead please um, just have a couple of questions for you I didn't see you um, and hello <laughs> um, so the state police does have a Rockville Barrett. Could could you speak to what assistance you receive, if any, on calls or when there's overload in your systems um, in and around Gaithersburg from the state police? So the state police, um, their primary responsibility from the Rockville Barracks um, are our are major roadways, the interstates, 270, 495. Um, they literally have responsibility from the American Legion Bridge mm -hmm. um, all around to the Beltway over to the Prince George's County line. And then they have, of course, all of 270 all the way up to the Frederick County line. Um, my understanding is on most shifts, uh, state police probably has about two to three troopers who are covering um, those, uh, those areas of roadway. Um, so they do not respond to um, calls for service generally um, in, um, in any of the municipalities from that perspective unless they're on the interstate. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Um, and, and as Ms. Farag noted, neighborhoods do not experience safety equally. And, and uh, as I sit correct. next to my neighbor who represents Gaithersburg and, and I represent just outside the city limits, um, I know that's been a major concern for our residents in 6D. Um, and, and to be fair, the residents, um, particularly the folks in Cider Mill, have met with us repeatedly with Commander Stancliffe. They've been asking for extra patrol in and around the community. Um, and I know that, and I appreciate the work that has been done collaborating both with Commander Stancliffe and with um, the Housing Opportunities Commission to get the residents things that they need and want there to help them feel safer in their, in their homes. Um, but I know that every time the answer is always, we don't have enough officers available to send extra patrol officers around at different times. And, um, I know and uh, that that I have been very <laughs> loud about trying to get the Police Standards Training Commission to fix something that should have been fixed over a year ago uh, with respect to recruitment. Um, and again, saying it louder for those in the back row who need to hear it, you cannot, under state law, presently refuse to certify a law enforcement officer based on prior cannabis use. But unfortunately, our Police Standards Training Commission, which is the licensing body that oversees all training and um, certification of officers throughout the state of Maryland, regardless of whether your state, local, or municipal departments, has refused to change that regulation. Um, how are you all three experiencing that as a problem in terms of your recruiting? So I would uh, first of all say, again, that's impactful. Uh, we know that we lose um, a good number of good, we think that there are good qualified candidates based upon the current um, commission's uh, rules. I know I've testified in front of the commission 
Um, and they are looking at that um, because I think it's something that, again, in, in today's environment, the realities of where we are um, and we are generally hiring young, young you know, individuals to, to join this profession. Um, and there is a large numbers of them um, who have experimented with cannabis um, in their early days. Um, and these are the things that are disqualifying them as potential candidates that are hurting clearly um, our numbers to be able to hire. Chief Brito. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's certainly impactful for us. Um, you know, there's uh, the commission has very strict standards, um, and it really doesn't comport to you know what has happened in the legislature, effective July 1st of this year. So um, it is impactful for us. Um, you know, so uh, I, you know, I hate to lose any decent candidate um, for something that's legal that's legal now in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Chief Sroka. It has an impact. Um, it's also important to note that the Training Commission has um, reduced those standards for cannabis use. It used to be if you used marijuana within uh, more than 10 times within your lifetime, you were disqualified and not eligible for certification. Um, and the previous standard was within three years, um, you could not use it prior to being hired, and now it's within one year. What I have found is, is that when candidates have used um, marijuana on multiple occasions um, that recent, there was usually other factors in their background that we found um, that precluded them from being hi being hired as well. So we're looking, that's one component of many that we're looking at um, to make a hiring decision to hire well-qualified people. And then in terms of, um, obviously, when there are extensive vacancies in any department and folks are working overtime, and, and as noted, the heart of this uh, hearing is uh, assignments being shuffled in order to um, do the best you can with the resources that you have. Um, how is that affecting overall officer morale? And how is that affecting deployment of community policing model in the prevention aspect and positive community policing? Well, I'll first start with uh, filling in overtime. Um, you know, again, we have to have a base, base level, what we call minimum staffing for any given shift in any district. That we know that these are the minimum number of officers that we need to fill a sector, a beat, um, in order to make sure that we have coverage um, throughout that entire police district for that particular shift. Um, and there can be a wide variety of reasons why um, there may be a need for to fill that, um, to get to minimum staffing based upon, you know, officers who may be out injured, officers who called in sick for that day, officers who are on leave. All of those dynamics kind of play in a role. Um, and so there is a higher demand, you know, because we have lower staffing levels, um, because, you know, many shifts are very close to being, if they're not already at minimum staffing mm -hmm. levels on a regular day. Right. And so it might warrant that, you know, that some shifts have to utilize what we call the callback list in order to bring in officers on, on overtime in order to fill those shifts, um, you know, again, at any given day, time or night. Um, and so with that being said, um, it is clear to me, right, that officers are, are being matched. I mean, there are other dynamics that are occurring. There are protests. There are other events. There are sporting events. Those events have to be filled on an mm -hmm. overtime basis as well. Mm -hmm. And we have to, again, outside of the officer's normal course of doing business, whether it's going to court um, or any other detail that may be um, specified for you know large gatherings or events, um, it is a higher demand of overtime than we've seen in quite some time. Uh, Morale-wise, I think the officers are in good spirits, but I think at some point they are somewhat overworked, right? And that is a concern of ours. Um, and how do we address that? Um, and this is one of the ways, it's not the only way. We, are, we have other ideas, um, vision, 
Um, for me, there's a strategic piece to this that I must, again, uh, talking with our assistant chiefs and um, how we come up with strategies, we've, you know, I have a vision about, you know, redistricting, um, where we look at, and we have not done this in quite some time. We have been, you know, in, in you know, um, focused on a lot of other things in, in my four-year tenure. But right. probably when I first took over was the time that we should have been really looking at a strategic plan to actually redistrict because we hadn't done this. We hadn't looked at the numbers in a long time. And when you look at the unevenness of the workload across the county, you see where there's generally there, that tells you that there is a need to redistribute the work, you may say, to some degree at best that we can. So I have, again, come up with some ideas. We're continuously working on that. Um, we think we will have something within the next few months in order to see what that will look like in order. And again, that can also probably impact the cities of Gaithersburg and Rockville mm -hmm. just the same, but more in a positive. That's where we would look to do this in a positive way, not in a negative way. Um, but it, it's a reality, and I agree with uh, Mr. Katz when we talked about, um, again, about you know, this is kind of like overdue. I think there's a perception and reality, right, when we talk about those areas such as Montgomery Village that you talk about. But from my perspective, and you're exactly right, when we look at the growth of this county, mm -hmm. you know, the strategic growth of this county, which is fabulous, mm -hmm. but infrastructure is a vital and important part of this. Right. And what we fail, in my opinion, to not do is to prepare a public safety component to the growth of the county. And mm -hmm. so therefore, this is why we're again in a struggle. When I looked at Montgomery Village as an example, and I believe they're building approximately uh, around a, a large number of homes, yeah. um, you know, particularly around the old Montgomery Village uh, uh, golf club. Of course, yep. That means there are more people going to move to Montgomery Village, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have not come up with a plan to increase the numbers of officers in the six districts as an example. That is, you know, so that's an example of what I, when I talk about a vision of growth uh, for our department, again, here we are a community of a million people, um, and we are way below um, the per officer, uh, per citizen capita um, in this region particularly, when you look at Fairfax County as an example, who has nearly 1,600 police officers mm -hmm. for the same amount of population. Mm -hmm. Um, and they have nine district police stations. We have six. It tells you that there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to really take a hard look at that um, as we continue to move forward. But this is one of the things that I think that we really have to understand from our perspective about where we need to go with staffing and why we're in sort of this, uh, this situation where we are in the calls for service. And then I know last week during the Criminal Justice Coordinating Commission meeting, we did have a discussion about court and yes. court dates and making sure, you know, because this is a part of an ecosystem, right? It's a longer, bigger, multi-component system that we have for public safety. And, and frankly, in our emergency response, we know we have mandatory staffing ratios and stuff for our fire EMS complement as well. And, and we have our mobile crisis team that we can add more people to, but we're having a hard time getting people to fill those roles. So it's a, it's a need that's across the board. But with respect to court, um, you know, just to be clear, we have issues where if we can't have the officers there present as the court is working its best way through clearing backlogs of dockets, there are consequences. Could you speak to that? Yes. Yeah, so, so again, the courts have demanded additional court dates for officers to actually go to court in order to address the backlog of, seri of their serious traffic docket. That includes driving while under uh, the influence of alcohol mm -hmm. um, as the primary offenses. But they're all other serious offenses of traffic uh, violations. And if the, and the officers, again, already under the burden of additional overtime demands that we have placed upon them, will be given an additional date or dates um, in any given month in order to go to court in order to overcome. If they don't show up, <clears throat> right, 
then those cases are going to be dismissed by the state's attorney's office. Right. Um, and that is not of benefit to this community right. um, as a result thereof. So this is, again, this is the, uh, you know, this other asterisk you might state of impact of staffing, right, that could have, and again, when we're, if we're pulling those officers off the street, right, to go to court, um, they, again, there's going to be some impact in their, their scheduling. Um, they're not available to respond to calls for service because they're in court. Right. That's the other dynamic of this. So there, yeah, there are, um, there are these X factors that, that definitely impact, that are impacting our staffing because of, you know, again, the courts trying to catch up from pre-COVID um, and, and during the COVID epidemic, um, that's the status in which they are. And we have to do our very best to help alleviate that problem with the courts as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Did you? I did want to welcome Councilmember Jawanda, who snuck in, I believe, that, and I wasn't aware he was here. He, he's not a member of the committee, but he certainly is a, a, a guest many, many times here. Please. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here today uh, and, and providing this window into how you all are dealing with the staffing issues that you're facing. Um, I, I think what you have described, what you're doing makes sense, makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and I think that it is, um, and, and the points that my colleagues raise are good ones. Um, I, I, I think that it makes a lot of sense for not just the council, but also the public to really have this window into um, how you're trying to juggle these different pieces and make things work given the staffing situation that's being faced. Um, and so, you know, as they're looking at call times and as they, um, you know, see impacts, whether negative or positive, and results of some of these changes, that they have an understanding of what's happening and what we're dealing with. And as they see the recruitment efforts, that they have an understanding and all of those things, I think more, the more information here um, is better and, and helpful. To, so I, I appreciate you all coming here to deliver this briefing. Um, the mission centered staff. Staffing, that also makes a lot of sense um, and so in that same vein it would be great to get you know a, a deeper window into what that looks like um, where you are um, uh, where you're able to to not able to but where you're having to pull from different spots or, or hold those spots open for now um, it would be great for for us to know that and also for the public to know that and maybe this is even something we would uh, consider for a for another briefing on another day is a deep dive into that mission-centered staffing well I, I yeah. think I'm interrupting you but Sorry. I think we need to have an update on where we are probably right after the first of the year. It's my understanding you want to start this November 1st? Is That's that, correct, yes. So that would give you give us enough time to, that you can yeah, get through the holidays, et cetera. So. Great, so yeah. great. So yeah, in, in advance of that update, um, it would be great to get um, some more detailed information about what the mission-centered staffing looks like, um, including you know um, which spots you've had to hold open, but also like where is overtime having to be spent, all of those different pieces just to give us and the public a better understanding. Thank you. Councilmember Trapondo. Thank you and good morning. Good to be with you. Thank you all for your service and continued updates. Uh, and I may have missed this earlier from Ms. Farag. The, I just wanted to get an update. How was the 20, the incentive money boosting? Yeah, we didn't talk about that. We okay, we didn't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but that's, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah, so the, the $20,000 that uh, it actually is, uh, we're, we're, we're we're monitoring that as we speak. Um, we had that get approved right at the end of our current class being actually put together. So we couldn't say that, you know, that it had a significant impact on on our on that on the class that's currently in session. Um, I'll let uh, Assistant Chief Frank uh, speak to uh, where we are in our current numbers and what that, what's that look like uh, currently. Good morning. So preliminary, our preliminary information on the bonus is that about 60% of the uh, candidates have indicated that they were highly, in, highly uh, impacted by the $20,000 bonus as a reason for applying. Now there's different levels in the data that we're collecting. So that's number five, right? Four, three, two. So sure. we're going to get a fuller picture of all that. But our, our assessment so far has been very successful in increasing our numbers. The right now we're just over 300 applications. We've got a little bit longer to go for this winter class. Winter classes are harder to fill because the everything's harder in the winter. Well, 
the main thing is college graduation. Yeah. Our college graduations, even though they're they're changing up a little bit, is still mainly that everyone graduates in May, which makes them uh, great candidates for a summer class. So we've set a goal of 30 for this uh, upcoming class in January, and we're doing every, everything we can to meet that goal. Uh, the positive on the recruiting side, for our last class, we started with 24. We're down to 22 in the academy. That, what that means to us is our attrition rate ha has changed dramatically in, within the academy. We used to lose a lot more, but we've got a lot of very good resources, a lot of good training, and very solid candidates there. So th we want to see that trend continue because just because we bring 30 people in, uh, we need to stay as close to that 30 graduating. So we're, we're very pleased with that so far. We're nowhere near the numbers we need to be uh, to match the attrition with uh, the impending retirements from from the drop program, uh, as the chief noted, you know, January 2025 provided there's not a substantial change, uh, we could be looking at 200 officers down from Montgomery County, and we've said this before in in, in hearings. So uh, we are going. We continue to do everything we can to find uh, officers, whether it be lateral comparative compliance, whether it be. Uh, a, a, you know, even rehiring folks that uh, had left for other departments. We've had some luck with that recently. Officers have come back and seen some changes with the benefits package here and decided they wanted to come back. So all of those, all of those little things help. In 300 applications, that's, that's in the up direction. That, that is slightly up. Nowhere near, nowhere near the 4,000 applications right. when I was hired, but, sure. but 300, we'll take it. We, yeah. we want to hit 400 applications yeah. for, for this next class. We've got a number of, we've got a number of folks that uh, just cleared medical for their uh, conditional offers, so we're, we're creeping up towards 10, 10 officers hired for this next class, but we've got a bunch more that are still in the rest of the background uh, process. Well, and one of the things I wanted to flag, and I appreciate working with you and your team on the partnership on the Community Informed Police Training Act and the relationship with Montgomery College, and there's obviously been a couple of those class, I guess two now, or come, just one, coming up on two, that will take the curriculum. Uh, you know, are we seeing, I'd be curious to know, and if you don't know today is fine, but for Ms. Farag too, like what the, from that population, community college, people who are, uh, you know, I often mentioned it's somewhere between six and 700 students studying criminal justice at Montgomery College mostly kids of color, mostly students that are from Montgomery County, people that we would want, you know, I agree on the earlier point, we don't, and both Councilman Lukey and I share this, we don't want them being excluded because of marijuana usage, for, for example, and I'm glad we're on the right side on that issue. Um, are you seeing, did, have you been able to notice any uptick in the applications from them? And if not, can we look into that and just track that? I know you were gonna ramp up the outreach and engagement there. So I don't have numbers for that aspect, and we can get those numbers. What I will say is we've opened up some doors that weren't open before. We're taking part in a panel. Uh, we, we've done some other work, but we're taking part with a panel with uh, professors and students, uh, question and ask. And, uh, I plan on being there as well as uh, Captain Pratt and some other officers. So when you open doors like that, it's, it's a very positive thing, especially because we want residents of Montgomery County to be Montgomery County police officers, which I will say for the last class, we had a, a good deal of luck compared to uh, what we've seen in previous classes. So we're gonna continue to build upon that. Awesome. Thank you uh, and appreciate the work. And thank you, thank you as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I did want to note, we're going to end this one and get to the next topic, but you know, we're, when we talk as an example for the 6th District, and, and Councilmember Lukey brought this up, that as an, the area around South Lake Elementary, that is not in the city of Gaithersburg, but it certainly, right. literally, is across the street from right. the city of Gaithersburg, and what happens there affects the residents of the city of Gaithersburg. Asbury is right there. I mean, yes. they're very active in South Lake Elementary. So I, I think that though this is not, uh, when, when it first was reported, this was not something everybody thought, well, that's good. I mean, it, but now that we look into what we're doing, uh, the, the misinformation has become information right. rather than, I, I think this has a positive uh, effect for all of us. And this is, 
maybe it'll be shorter term. It, it, the, the reality is this will not be as short term as any of us would like, right. but this certainly will be something that will help us during the short term so that we can get ourselves back on track. And with that, we thank all of you for everything you do. And you. we will stop this part of the meeting. I have a feeling the Chief might stay here in the room a little bit. But the next item that we have is we're going to be discussing Bill 3223, the Police Advisory Commission and Amendments. This was rescheduled from uh, 91823. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, anyone who's, um, yes, uh, Ms. Uh, so, Gahini, if she would please come forward, and Ms. Frog, you're staying, I guess. Are you staying on this one? Or, yes. yes. And anyone else associated with this? Sakoni. Sakoni. I, 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 and I, ne <laughs> I never get your name right, so I knew that you knew how to pronounce it, but anyway. <laughs> and if I could ask uh, Mr. Sterling to please and others to please come forward, please. Sikoni, gosh, darn it. <laughs> okay. And who's going to lead this off, please? I'm, I'm please. stopping it. Kandikira <laughs> Sokoni is fine. <laughs> so, good morning, Council um, Committee Chair Katz and Council members. Good morning to you. Um, good morning. Good morning. You're welcome. So, uh, this is the committee work session for uh, uh, the Policing Advisory Commission Amendments Bill 3223. Uh, just for ease of following the packet, I just want to mention at the end we'll have there are four decision points that are listed at page five of my staff packet. And I also want to mention that we had some late additions, so when you see the notation corrected, there were some late additions including some proposed amendments from Council Member Mink. Um, So the proposed bill uh, seeks to do a number of things which are summarized at um, page two of the staff packet. And these include, um, and, and also just uh, for ease of following as well, there are two versions of the bill in the packet. The first version is the one that's at, uh, the first version at circle one is the bill, the version of the bill as introduced. And then if you'd like to see the version of the bill that reflects proposed amendments from Council Member Lukey, that's available at Circle 49. So the proposed bill, as introduced, seeks to do a number of things, including changing the name of the Policing Advisory Commission so that the commission would now be known as the Com Community Advisory Commission on Public Safety. Uh, I should note with this regard, in, in, in this regard that uh, Council Member Jawando, who's here and I'm sure will speak to this himself, uh, recommends um, uh, going with the name that is proposed by the NAACP, which is the Advisory Commission on Policing. And this is also a change, the, the name, that name is also supported by Council Member Mink's proposed amendments. The second proposed, and these are just highlights of the proposed bill, there's a provision on term limits. This would introduce term limits of two consecutive uh, three-year terms. And uh, uh, at some point, I would turn to the bill sponsor, Council Member Luki, to just clarify whether you had in mind um, limiting it to two full terms, because we've also introduced staggered terms in here. So if we don't say full terms, then someone, for instance, who was appointed to a staggered term of one year, if you haven't said two full terms is the limit, then they would max out at four. Uh, so that's a clarification to be made. And with regard to the term limits, I should also just highlight that even though we do have, we have the provisions in the code for the Policing Advisory Commission, we also have a standalone article in the code on, that addresses VCCs, boards, commissions, and committees. And that has default provisions. So even if you didn't do anything in this bill about term limits, that default pro, uh, law on BCCs does provide for term limits uh, of a maximum of two terms that can't be more than three years and that uh, no one person can serve more than two terms unless they have a break of a year. So just to mention that for context. And I apologize, I didn't address that in my staff uh, packet, but I just want to throw that out there. 
uh, I'm at page two, I'm still at page two of my staff packet. One of the, uh, I mentioned the term limits and also introducing staggering terms, uh, which is new. Uh, then we also have changes to the scope of the commission. So the proposed bill uh, seeks to make it clear that the commission is responsible for advising the county council on certain policing matters and is not an oversight body of the police department. They are uh, both in, when I get to the um, public testimony and from correspondence from others, there are you know, mixed, mixed uh, reactions to that, but there is a proposed, certainly a proposed provision in this bill uh, to, to expressly state that this is not uh, an oversight body. With regard to the scope of the commission, uh, one of the proposals in the, in the bill as introduced is to clarify that the commission does not consider policing matters relative to police misconduct and discipline that fall within the scope of the PAB, the police, the police advisory board, uh, sorry, the police accountability board. Lots of acronyms to keep track of. Uh, and uh, this proposal actually was was included, I believe, in order to align with uh, the all law report and recommendations when we were reviewing the prior version of the bill, which was uh, Bill 2723. The bill as introduced also seeks to change the membership structure of the PAC. Um, and start that those changes will be reflected starting at line 15 of the bill in your packet. Um, it would change the number and eligibility of commissioners. At present, uh, each member of the council nominates a public member to the commission. It is proposed that this would change so that the um, uh, commission, all commissioners would now be uh, would now be appointed by the council as a whole. Uh, I should mention in this regard that the current version of the law still has a reference to nine, nine council members. So depending on what the, uh, the committee decides to recommend and what council ultimately decides to do, regardless, we would have to update that to reflect the 11 members. Uh, and so um, we also, with regard to that, I should also just mention that in the definition section, um, of the bill, we will now be, and, and I'll, I'm referring to circle two of the bill, um, we would, we're, in, we're, we're referring to public members, but we're also now going to include a youth member and a young adult member, and I'll get to those in a bit more detail when we get to the proposed amendments. Uh, still at page, now at page three of the staff packet, there's a change to um, uh, voting uh, eligibility and changing the fact that now the previously ex-official members, which were the institutional members, uh, the chief of police and the um, uh, the 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 um, president of the police union, that those would now be changed from non-voting to voting, and depending on what you do with the amendments. I'd like to touch real brief on the um, impact statements. Um, the two impact statements, the economic impact statement and the climate, both had um, uh, hardly any impact. The um, all laws, racial equity and social justice, RESJ impact statement dated September 7th, does anticipate that this bill could have negative impacts on racial equity and social justice in the county. As its amendments, the, the statements indicates that the amendments changing the composition of the Policing Advisory Commission could diminish its independence and power in promoting policing best practices that advance RESJ in the county. Olo has mentioned a number of changes that could be made to try and offset that, and those are spelled out at page three um, of my staff packet, including um, keeping the prior, the current, keeping the status quo of having the police chief and the FOP president remain non-voting members. They also suggest reintroducing the uh, two voting members, although that's something that uh, Council Member Luki is already proposing to do in the amendments that she proposes. And then uh, repealing the, uh, this is, these are uh, additional recommendations from OLO to promote RESJ in the county, would be to remove the provision that requires, uh, requires that um, business interests and homeowners and homeowners associations should be included uh, on the pack. 
turning to page four of the staff packet, there's a series of proposed amendments. Um, I'm happy to walk through them, although um, I'll defer to the chair on whether you'd like uh, Council Member Luki as a sponsor to, to walk through them. In, in real brief, in summary, the amendment to um, amendment number one would be to designate a seat for a young person and then uh, also have a young adult uh, member. Um, so the proposed amendment would retain two specifically designated seats for young people that would be separate from the institutional seats, which is for the police chief and the police union. Another second amend amendment number two uh, would be to reserve the youth member would be nominated by the MCPS. We're good at it. We're good at it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, so fine. amendment yeah. number two, no. which is on the youth member, the youth member is is to be appointed is to be nominated by MCPS. Amendment number three would have a young adult. I also want to mention there's an amendment number four, which I did not. It was just an omission from the packet. It actually was presented by Council Member Luki. Amendment number four would be to require that completion of the Citizens Academy is mandatory and therefore if someone did not, someone who is required to do the Citizens Academy, if that was not completed within one year, that they would be removed. I recommend that if, if the committee uh, wishes to proceed with this, I'll just recommend that you add some due process uh, into the removal. Um, for failure to comply with uh, this requirement. I should also mention just um, by, in, I cruised through the uh, various provisions on the youth and uh, young adult uh, provisions. The youth member would be a member who's a high school uh, student and their term would actually just be a year as, as, as proposed. Uh, we did have a public hearing on September 25th, and the testimony is all uh, included in the packet at Circle 47. I also just want to point out that Council Member Jawando submitted a letter dated September 13th, 2023, uh, in which, as I mentioned earlier, he expresses support for the name change, although he's proposing that we go with the name that's proposed by the NAACP. The decision points I mentioned are summarized at page five of the staff packet. So the committee would have to decide whether to recommend to council enactment of the bill as introduced or whether to adopt any or all of the proposed amendments. You would also have a decision point on whether to uh, recommend to council adoption of the proposed amendment that provides for a seat on the commission for a young, for a youth a uh, high school member nominated by MCPS. The third decision point is whether to recommend to council adoption of the proposed amendment that the youth or high school member be exempt from completing the Citizens Academy training. Uh, fourth decision point is whether to recommend to council the proposed amendment that provides that the young adult member who will be someone under the age of 25 and is a resident of the county and uh, decision point number five is um, whether to uh, recommend the, um, the amendment to the bill as introduced, which provides that if a commissioner does not complete the Citizens Academy training within one year, that they would be removed. I'll turn it over back to the chair if there are any specific questions uh, about the packet. Well, thank you very much. And as I sincerely appreciate that I can never pr pronounce your name correctly, and I apologize in advance. Uh, so so Gahini. Sokoni. So oh my gosh. So, so, yes. So I, I should call you by your first name. I can pronounce that. But anyhow, um, I, I do thank you for your for your uh, uh, packet and and help. Um, I think we need to go through each recommendation as we go through because there's suggested amendments uh, uh, from. Uh, people on, on the uh, committee as well as Councilmember Juando. But as we begin, I would like the panel to please uh, introduce themselves so that the public is aware who's sitting here. Yeah, and you'll be next. Susan Farra, Council Staff. Yeah, it's on. Th 
Thank you, Chairman Katz. I'm Eric Sterling. I'm the chair of the Policing Advisory Commission. Mr. Chairman, I'm Ty McKinney. I'm the vice chair of the Policing Advisory Commission. Good morning. I'm Cherie Branson. I'm on the Policing Advisory Commission. I'm also the third vice president of the Montgomery County NAACP. But this morning, I'm wearing my PAC hat. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn to Councilmember Lukey. Thank you, and um, and thank you, Ms. Saccone, for all of the, the work. I know there's a lot of moving pieces and parts, and I appreciate you going through that. Um, I'll say right off the bat that like, I think we can take care of one of the amendments right quick, because uh, I'm all good with the Advisory Committee on Policing. So to the extent that that, that is uh, one of the amendments, I think if we're all in agreement, we can just uh, check that box. And I'm in so that's the name change, so that everyone's aware of what mm -hmm. what we're talking about. And you're okay with that, and I'm mm -hmm. okay. That's a three to zero. Um, so to to talk through a little bit of this and um, and what why I went to went through this and why I think this is so important. Um, when the PAC was originally created, it was prior to the Police Accountability Act of 2021 at the state. And I want to note that the RESJ -E statement in the packet talks about um, oversight. Now, as the PAC, PAC was originally constituted, it did not have any statutory oversight authority. What has happened over time is that members have sort of started to think that that was a thing they were supposed to be tasked to do. Simultaneously, state law did set up a rather robust framework for civilian police oversight. And we do have that here in the county. So uh, for example, uh, the PAB, that the composition of the PAB is specified under Public Safety Article 3-102 that requires that each county, each local government had to establish the membership of the Police Accountability Board, budget and staff, appoint a chair. Um, and the chair has to be someone with relevant experience to the position and establish the procedures for record keeping. It clearly specifies that the PAB cannot have an active police officer as a member. It is civilian. Um, and to the extent practicable, the membership of the PAB shall reflect the racial, gender, and cultural diversity of the county. The PAB also appoints the civilian members of the Administrative Charging Committee, which is the entity that determines what is going to happen with police misconduct. Um, that body has a chair, uh, two civilian members selected by the PAB, and then they have two civilian members selected by the county executive. Um, before serving as a member of that ACC, each individual shall receive training on matters relating to police procedures from the Maryland Police Tra Training and Standards Commission. Um, and there's a whole list of responsibilities that they have under that aspect of the public safety article. Then there's the third entity, the third stop in the in the civilian oversight framework that was established by the Police Accountability Act 2021, and that is the trial board. On the trial board, it must be composed of an actively serving or retired administrative law judge, retired judge of the district or circuit court here in Maryland, appointed by the CEO of the county, so our county executive, a civilian, who is not a member of the ACC, and the PAB appoints that civilian member, and then a police officer of equal rank to the police officer who is accused of misconduct by the law enforcement agency. Um, and there was developed a standardized framework so that no matter where you were in the state of Maryland, there would be a disciplinary matrix that was put forth that every time could go to to determine what the consequences would be for any misconduct. So we have here in Montgomery County the functioning PAB, ACC, and the trial board. Um, but what we do need a place and space for, and I have been committed to this from the get-go, is the space for advice and advising. That is the function of this group. Um, and I've expressed this, I know, to our chair, and, and I've, I've talked about this with Councilmember Jolando, that I feel like the fact that the PAC was constituted and came to being 
in the core heart of the pandemic and could only meet online and there were all kinds of other things going on that presented logistical challenges um, that was hard and and that was challenging for the body to do what it needed to do um, but we do still need a place for that we just need clear direction and directive as to what that should be um, I think that clarifying this through this bill helps the public better understand and it helps you as a body to, to be able to ask the PAB for input on what they're seeing and what is happening with the ACC and the trial boards. Um, the voting piece and the reason that I have proposed to have all members vote stems from it seemed to be that there was some confusion about what ex officio members do or do not do on our many boards, counties, and uh, boards, committees, and commissions, BCCs. We have way too many acronyms here. Um, typically, they vote. Members who hold a role on a board, committee, or commission, if they hold that role as a result of their employment or work with a county executive department, or even as a legislative member, right? I have a vote on the boards, committees, and commissions that I serve on. I'm not there just to sit there off to the sideline. I'm there to actively participate. And in my experience at the state, we'd have multiple bodies that were constituted with diverse and divergent opinions, perspectives, and the best way to get to the best possible outcome was to have everybody be able to sit at that same table together, talk through those issues, be required to listen to divergent opinions, and figure out the best possible outcome and advice. Um, as constituted with the amendments that we've discussed, the body would have 15 members, so two of the members would be appointed by the chief of police or the FOP, that is two out of 15. That is it. Um, there is no, in no way, shape, or form any disproportionality that, and it makes it akin to the remaining boards, committees, and commissions that we have here in the county. Um, and with respect to changing the membership to approval by the body as a whole, um, when the PAC was created and it was one council member, one person, that was vastly different from every other board committee and commission that we have. And we have, I believe, over 80 of them here. Yep. And especially given the fact that, and I know this is the tone of the new council, as we say, the 20th council, we want greater transparency. And um, I believe since we've come into office, all of us, all 11 of us, have been very much engaged in ways that, again, weren't as easily facilitated during the pandemic, but also because there are six additional voices here. And again, you make the best improvements by having everybody be able to share and speak and participate. Um, the requirement for attending the Citizens Academy and the reason why I'm proposing an amendment that says that if they fail to complete it within a year was because that actually was a, an issue under the PAC, um, where we had members who did not ever go through the, the Citizens Training Academy. Now, I think a lot of that had to do with the pandemic, right? Um, a lot of that had to do with the way things were at the time. But we want to make that clear that it is required, not optional. No different from the way that the state statutes require that the Police Standard Training Commission provide instruction to those who serve on the ACC, et cetera, um, that they have that instruction and that knowledge base. Um, of course, removing that and not requiring that for our student member, because that would be onerous. And with respect to the student member, um, I did request that it be for a one-year term, but that it says they can serve up to three years. Because let's say you have someone who's a freshman or a sophomore and they happen to be the one who is appointed, want to, on the one hand, give flexibility to the students because their lives are rapidly changing. They may be able to participate one year. They may want to be able to do it for the remainder of their high school years, but at least it gives them some flexibility and matches better sort of the the life cycle of a, of a high school student. Um, and I think those are the most, uh, cover most of the, the pieces of this. Um, and 
to Ms. Ciccone's point related to due process, um, I, I, again, my writing of that without creating a due process provision was with respect to the fact that there is not a, a right to service on a board committee or commission. Um, so it's distinct from employment or something like that. Even at the state level within the state government article, if someone is appointed to a board or a public body, if they fail to show up for 50% of the meetings, they're automatically discharged. There is no due process right. So that is why I did not include that in the drafted amendment um, but you know happy to hear your advice and we can have a discussion about that so thank you mr. chair thank you anyone else want to comment on I think we'll go through each each one we've certainly oh I'm sorry I didn't see you <laughs> just me I have to leave at 1130 so I just I guess I'll just Go say, through all of them. Just say Absolutely. what I think yeah. now, and you got—I can't vote anyway here, so you know. Right. Uh, but I can—I can do my best to persuade. Um, you? Oh, it's hard. So, <laughs> so uh, just yeah, just a little history. I appreciate Ms. Ciccone's work on this, and I appreciate uh, Bill Sponsor outlining the uh, intentions here. Uh, as I mentioned in my letter. I was one of the co-lead sponsors of this bill with council member, former council member Reamer, um, and it was co-created with community input, uh, working with the NAACP and, and others over, over a, a good bit of time. Uh, and in a big important step in a response to the national conversation on how do we change and have more community involvement in the reimagining of what policing looks like. Um, and I think that's important because a lot went into that and we, we acknowledged at the time that you know we knew the charter amendment was coming and we knew we may have to make some adjustments to the law at some point and we did we did talk about that uh, for example you know we might have to if the current structure may, remains we would have to move it as you said Mr. Ciccone to 11 members being appointed because there's 11 council members now um, but I think it was very clear uh, this bill passed unanimously uh, and uh, we had over 200 people apply to be on the PAC, uh, now, now, now soon to be the ACP, um, uh, and it, which is the most that I've ever seen and I think that have been interest in the public. Um, obviously, the challenges of the pandemic created some challenges, but it's important to know that there was unanimous support and a lot of people uh, applied. I think we want to strengthen the PAC and the ACP, not not weaken it. And unfortunately, I think many of these amendments have that effect uh, of weakening the influence, the impact, uh, diluting the voice uh, of the, the ACP, which is or the PAC, uh, which is not the goal. Uh, this was to elevate community input. There was interest in it. There still is interest in it. Um, and uh, so I'm hoping that we can leave the bill intact you know, for the most part, because the youth, there already are youth members, right? You know, I appreciate the amendment, but they, they already exist. Um, limiting it to MCPS and appointed by the board, as I think one of these amendments kind of excludes a, a set of folks from other schools, parochial schools and others, um, and is, is just not, I don't think it's necessary. Um, adding voting members. Um, as the, I'm sure the members of the PAC will tell you, they've appreciated the ex officio uh, participation of the police chief and the union. Um, but this is this is a body for civilian input, uh, and there doesn't need to be a vote. And that there's a power imbalance that exists in the community. You don't need to bring that uh, into the room. And I think adding a vote does do that. It dilutes it, and and could create an issue in the room. Uh, I, I really appreciate the work that the PAC members have done. They've produced like really important documents and, and advice. And I'll speak to that. Um, oversight is one of those words, you know, I always tell my kids all the time that English language is, is uh, squishy. It's not a, it's not, a, you, you often need another word to define a word. Um, the PAC does not have a, uh, any authority as far as funding or directing the police department to do anything uh, that's very clear and, and that was never intended the one bit of 
quote unquote oversight, and I don't really even care if we change the word, but I, the reason I have a, an issue with repealing the, the language is again, again it, it kind of seeks to diminish the role. There is a requirement in the law that the uh, data request from the PAC to do its work had to be responded to in 30 days. We know that that has not happened on several occasions. Um, there could be perfectly, and I'm sure there are some perfectly good reasons for that, right? People miss deadlines all the time. I know the PAC has missed deadlines for, for some reasons or, or not, and that's okay. But I think we don't want to say we want the department to be a partner and be responsive so that they can do their work uh, and make their rec which is the work to make recommendations to us about police uh, policy change. Um, and so it's not oversight in the sense of uh, telling the police department what to do. It's it's being able to be a partner that gets there's what they're asking responded to so that they can do their work. Um, and that's my issue with that amendment. Uh, I do think they're having the executive appoint the two, uh, nominate the two young people is, is a good thing. Uh, it gets some buy-in from them. Uh, and, you know, if, if that uh, needed to be changed, it wouldn't be the worst thing. We, we could, it's primarily our body. We could nominate the youth members, but I think we should be able to nominate them. That's, that was the intent. The final thing I'll say just as introduction or, or you know, on this, the amendment to have each member of the council appoint a person. That was my amendment, to, or my contribution to the bill, it wasn't an amendment, my contribution to the bill, um, and or one of them. And it was based on a similar body out in California that we looked at that did that. And it was really important, and I think it worked in the sense that in this issue of reimagining public safety, people are concerned about what voices are in the room. And this allows the very diverse council to all have a voice of who and have a perspective in, in based on their life experiences and what we were elected to do. It's also important to note that the nomination doesn't secure a that you're appointed. Every the full council does have to approve the nomination. Uh, so there is still a role for the full council. And we discussed that at length at the time too. Uh, it's just that I, Councilman Drano, put forward X person proposing it to the council, that person still would need to secure six votes uh, from the council. So if there was some objection, there could be a discussion about that. Um, as opposed to our normal process, and this is not a normal process because this was not a normal body. This is a body where their recommendations are made and it's kind of not in public view and everyone is kind of pushed together. You could have the, uh, which is what happens a lot of times, you could have a, a, a majority of the council nominate everybody. And uh, hopefully that wouldn't happen, but it could. Um, and so that was why I think this is an important piece to put in. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there, Mr. Chair, and just that's how I, uh, my view, I think we need to be strengthening and tweaking the name, which, which we all agree on, uh, not uh, diluting in any way. Oh, the last thing I'll point out, and it wasn't mentioned by Ms. Ciccone, you know, the racial equity impact statement of this bill uh, is not good. Uh, it says that it would have a negative impact uh, on racial equity um, by changing the composition. It could diminish its independence and power in promoting policing best practices to advance racial equity and social justice. It offers several proposed amendments as required by law, not in some of them I just mentioned, not allowing the police chief and FOP to have a vote, not repealing the age requirements of the two voting members, and not putting in business owners and homeowners because we shouldn't be weighing one group uh, over another. Council members can put forth whoever they want who could be business and homeowners, but we don't want to, uh, currently it says reflect the racial and economic diversity of the counties, communities, including religious creed, age, sex, including on the basis of gender identity, orientation, disability, and geographic location with an emphasis, this is important, on those disproportionately impact, impacted by inequities in policing. Uh, this, that amendment could totally flip that on its head. So uh, I, I hope that we will uh, strengthen this, this body, not uh, weaken it. And uh, those are my comments at this point. Thank you very much. Did you? Just real quick. 
Um, I'm going to thank you for that um, and to everybody for their comments. I'm going to uh, hold most of my comments as we go through amendment by amendment, but I just wanted to note on the name change, actually, would, would anybody have an objection to doing advisory commission for policing instead of on policing to avoid the I, unfortunate I would. acronym? Okay. Yeah, I would have an objection okay. to that. This is, it, it's on policing, not for the police. They are in a body that would be advising the, um, the council, the, the uh, and the county executive rather than advising the police directly. So I'll note that that suggestion and open to others or, or we could just not, but um, is just noting that if we keep it on policing, the acronym is A COP. A COP. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that, but you know, somebody, I, I don't believe we should be doing this for the, for the acronym. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We usually don't include the practice. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. All right, all right, all right. Okay, back to the other amendments. Okay. Is that? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So, do you want to lead us through each one so that we can have those discussions, please? Yes. And I just want to be absolutely clear. So, that's a unanimous uh, recommendation on the change of the name to Advisory Commission for Policing? No. 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 On, on, policing. On, on policing. On policing. Thank you. And that was your original suggestion. Yeah, or, yeah. The NAACP. or whoever, but I mean, oh, yeah. that was the amendment you brought forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not. Somebody brought it to my attention. I'm bringing Yeah, right. yeah, okay. No pride of authorship, is that what that means? <laughs> so the amendment number one um, would be the amendment that would retain two specifically designated seats for young people that would be separate and apart from the 11 public members selected by council. These will also be separate and apart from the two institutional members um, uh, from the you know the police chief and the and the and the police union. So if I could if we could turn um, specifically to the uh, at circle fifty uh, just to highlight that in the definition section would we'll be saying a young adult member is an appointee to the commission who must be under the age of 25 at the time of appointment and a resident of the county. That would be distinct from a youth member at line 15. A youth member would be defined as someone who is enrolled as a Montgomery County Public School MCPS high school student and is nominated by the MCPS Board of Education to serve on this commission. Yeah, please. So, um, and I know this was raised in terms of, and, and I appreciate Council Member Jawando pointing out that that would limit it to public school students. And um, to be candid, I, I requested it written that way because uh, certain laws related to school safety only apply to our public schools. So the Safe to Learn Act of 2018 does not apply to any of our public, sorry, our non-public or private schools. It only applies to um, the 24 local school systems throughout the state. I, I for my opinion on this one, I, I believe that it should be open to any youth. I don't believe it should be open only to um, Montgomery County Public Schools, or certainly uh, would hope that, that they, that's the vast majority of the youth that are, that are in schools or in Montgomery County Public Schools. But I don't believe we should limit it in any way. Uh, and if someone who was in a private school, a parochial school, a, a homeschooled, whatever, uh, that applies, uh, they should be considered just like everyone else. That's my opinion. Um, I would agree with that and, um, and, uh, and, and appreciate the effort to include more young people, uh, more, more youth at the table. Um, I would ask that um, we, we don't want to eliminate one of the other seats that was established by the previous council. Uh, the, so this, with the 26 to 35 seat, I think we want to, we can add, I think we can add a seat and that makes sense and I and again appreciate the additional um, representation from, uh, from young people there um, and think it's appropriate that we, you know, not have a, a requirement for the Citizens Academy for those for those young folks, um, but I would I want to make sure that we retain again retain the seats that were advocated for in order to make sure that we're keeping that diversity of young people, um, including the the 25 and under and the 26 to 35, um, as well as if we want to add a high school seat, then then we could do that as well. So um, then at line 15, 
if it would read youth member means someone who is enrolled as a high school student so we take out the where well, I don't even know the word enrolled because mm -hmm. they don't know if they were homeschooled they're not enrolled are they that's a good point can we just make it an age yeah so well Yes, but uh, uh, you're not enrolled as a homeschooled student. You are subject to the local school system's monitoring of your education plan. Okay, so, so I don't know. I mean, there again, I, I, I understand where we are, mm -hmm. but I, I think we need to be clear that, that someone could apply. That doesn't necessarily mean they'd be appointed, but they could apply. So we could put youth member means an individual who is high school aged. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of that amendment requires a nominating uh, thing. So could it be that they receive a letter of recommendation from their school or academic advisor, however you have it? Um, I'm hesitant to just add more. I'm hesitant to add more yeah. restrictions. Again, we have a process, a, you know, a vetting process that we'll get to do, and people get to apply. I'm hesitant to add more restrictions into the law itself. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, I'm not. I don't know that we need to have, have it nominated. Uh, okay. I believe if the person nominates themselves and shows interest, that they should be discover. Uh, you know, they, uh, 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 that we should have the discussions about them. Yeah. Um, just a clarification question for Ms. Farag. Have the student and I would say younger adult members of the body consistently been participating in the PAC since its inception or have there been issues with vacancies? We lost both members who were under the age of 25 due to absentee issues. And I just I do want to just put out this out there for the committee's um, consideration is that a minor is actually subject to whatever that minor's parents want that minor to do. And in one case, one of our members went yeah. back to a home country for the summer. Right. And it was very difficult to participate because of the time difference. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, very much encourage youth membership. And Ms. Sokoni and I have looked at different ways that we can really actually proactively target youth who might be really interested in serving on the PAC. Um, it has been under the executive's um, appointment right. authority to do that. And I have asked three or four times for the executive to send over nominations and I didn't, I haven't gotten them. So, I mean, that process has been suspended now that you're looking at legislation. But. Right. And this would allow, it, no matter what happens, it's my understanding, and I know Dr. Stoddard's sitting here, but it's my understanding that the county executive does not, no longer wants that authority, doesn't need that authority, doesn't want to appoint any members of their own and that we will do it. Dr. Stoddard, could you please come up and visit with us? Thank you. I spoke to the county executive on Friday. He's happy to keep this uh, responsibility. We haven't filled the positions okay. largely because we did not know whether, what the council was okay. going to do in this action. Okay. All right, so how would this read now at this point? Please, you cut That's off on. your mic. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't blame you, Mrs. Uh, Sacconi. Okay. See, I got it right this time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I should just mention that the way before before this bill, yeah. we had provision for young members. So we had uh, the, the delineation was one member would be 25 years of age or younger at the time of appointment. Then the second slot was reserved for a member who was 26 to 35. I just um, mm -hmm. just highlighting that because uh, right. Right. we, yeah. we right. previously did not have a high it turns out I think that we did have high school members but that was not required by the law so right. uh, just so I'm clear are we now we are retaining the student well I think I think we're still talking through that and the reason I gave us like a high school student cutoff is because they are they are legally different, but they have a unique perspective. And um, you know, we encourage student membership, whether it's on the Board of Education, you know, at the state level, the Maryland Association of Student Councils nominates those um, student members who are high school students to serve. Um, and then the other one capping it at 25, because that's, you're legally now an adult, but you know, in terms of brain development and cognition, your prefrontal cortex does not fully develop till you're 25. So there seemed to be a, a, a reason to establish an 18 to 25 year old member who was separate from that. Um, but that's just, those are the reasons why I chose the parameters that I did in, in crafting this um, to give that voice because there is, you know, whether there's issues with our young 
students or whether it's young adults, there, uh, you know, we could talk all day long about statistics on things going on, but that's where we often have conflict or where they feel like they don't have a voice. So that's where I wanted to create two distinct lanes in that regard. Someone who's 25 to 35 is very clearly an adult. Um, and I didn't want to take away the requirement of the any adult member, whether they are the young adult member or not, to attain a, a, to participate in the Citizens Academy because they are in fact legally adults and so they should be held to a different standard than a high school member. Council Member Juwanda. Thank you. Uh, so I think I appreciate you restating that, Mr. Coney. So we have currently 25 or younger and then 25 and 36. I think what I heard Councilman Mink propose, which I think would get at the goal, what I understand to be the goal of this, is add a keep those two, because I do think there is a large impacted community of folks who are just as involved in 25 to 36, um, as as is the but they are distinct, they are different in the than the younger than 25. Could you add a you know like a four, an 18 or younger, you know to keep to be consistent with how we've done this. You could say a range, but I, I get a little worried because people can be different ages at high school. But right now you have 20, so that would make an effect be if you added a person 18 or younger, that would mean it would be someone who's in high school. But if you wanted to get high school, you could say, I guess, 13 to 18, or if you wanted to do a range. And then you have, or 13 to 21 even, because you can have students in high school at that, you know, I think, what's the legal cutoff? Is it 21? 21. Yeah, so you could say 13 to 21. And then you have the 21 to, 25 I guess and then you have the and then you could have the 25 to 36 I mean so what could you just add an additional person to get the high school age and keep the, the two that would be what I would recommend Ms. Branson did you want to speak um, thank you um, I I really wanted to point out that the reasons in the I was also a part of the initial drafting of this legislation and so I wanted to point out that the initial reasons for having those age ranges had everything to do with the um, impact that the criminal justice system has on people in those age ranges it to, to not understand that young people um, are disproportionately impacted by their actions with law enforcement is is to fail to understand the nature and and um, underlying rationale for this legislation in the first place, right? So it to me, you know, having you know been an oversight council for twenty plus years, um, th that, you know, it's really important to keep in mind the fundamental thing you were trying to solve when you did the bill. And, and the fundamental thing we were trying to solve was the ability of young people to, to express their concerns, how they were impacted, what it meant to them that's what matters and so when we start you know peeling around with you know 13 or 17 or you know that that these become distinctions without a difference the the real the the grave amount of the concern was in fact that in these distinct groups they experienced law enforcement differently than people say my age that and 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 we wanted to make sure that that those young people understood that they mattered that we were expressing to them to please be involved and and that they needed to know that this was a place they were welcome. So when you start putting all these requirements because of this, that, and the other on top of this stuff, you're undermining the very rationale that, that inspired us 
to take this on. And I, I would just ask that this body remember that, that this is exactly, um, this is why we did it. I don't see any reason why that's not still important. Young people still disproportionately find themselves involved and often powerless in their interactions with police. They have to have a place to speak to that. Thank you. Ms. Farrand, did you? Something to add on this. I just I just wanted to comment on this operationally as far as trying to advertise and get positions filled. I realized there were over 250 applications initially when this pack was first formed and that has dropped dramatically. Um, the past few recruitments that we've done here on council have been 27, 11, and 17 applicants respectively. I have no idea what the universe of applicants are for juvenile for the youth positions over on the executive side and like I said Ms. Soconi and I have I have worked proactively to figure out, you know, much better ways to, to conduct outreach to get youth to be involved. But if there are too many requirements for too many different types of youth positions, yeah. I'm concerned we will not be able to fill I them. I, I, I agree with that. I think we need to keep this as, as open, as, as, uh, as easy uh, as we possibly can uh, and, and uh, hope. And, and, and recruit and do whatever is necessary to uh, to attract people of, of, of all ages to your point but but uh, certainly for our young people who who are bringing a different viewpoint to the to the table that's what this is about this is about a discussion so people should feel comfortable with each other and candidly in some cases I uh, they actually meet each other and realize that everybody, you know, uh, is, is working towards the same goal here, which is a better community. So I, I don't know what we need to consider changing or just, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if it's working right now, I understand the, the recruitment is a problem, but uh, once we get this new legislation, uh, then perhaps uh, we should just leave it alone and see where our next next statements need to be. So I'm comfortable with that. You're I'm comfortable you're, with that. You're different on this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm different only in that I want I want there to be some guidance so that people understand what it is. Um, and I was I'm fine with removing requirements that they be enrolled in a particular school system. Just that they you know obviously they're a resident here. Um, if they're they're serving, um, but that we have again a youth member because both teenagers, in terms of as as Ms. Branson noted, you know having interactions with law enforcement that they want to share how they feel about, and also to be frank, youth victims. Um, we have in the in the issues that we're having out in the community a disproportionate number of our youth are actually being affected themselves by issues within the community not necessarily always by other youth but by adults um, and they feel vulnerable and they should have a place and space to share that with them about again creating a better community so um, there is a legal significance once they've turned 18. So while it's true that a public school student can remain in a public school up till the age of 21, um, that is for, for certain students um, and not reflective of the student body as a whole. It is, it is more limited. Um, and so since there is a legal significance at the age of 18, I would just respectfully request that one of the roles be for someone who's 18 or under and one be for anyone you could you could make it from 18 to 36 35 I'm sorry what was the prior cutoff 26 to 35, 26 to 35. 20. sorry it the was prior it was there was 26 to 35 was one category and then we had the under 25 gotcha okay um, what would you uh, just polling up here if it was switched to be under 25 and 25 to 36 as it currently stands there are other amendments in here that relate to that in terms of the younger person, if you will, um, not being required to do the Citizens Academy and serving one year terms up to a succession of three total years. Again, that was done to accommodate high school students. Um, and then having the other member who would be the 25 to 36 year old mandate that they they serve a three-year term just like any of the other 11 members um, and that they do participate in the Citizens Academy so thoughts 
I, I mean, I'm, I think that it makes sense to uh, to waive the requirement for the uh, for the younger person, and that might make it easier for our younger people to be able to serve, given their school schedules and all of that. Um, and um, but but I'm I'm hesitant to mess around with the ages or with eliminating either of the seats that were established by the previous. So if we leave the seats at the age oh, cutoffs, but the the training requirement for the old the older of the two younger members, I'll put it that way, for the up to thirty six year old member. I mean that's what it is right now. So I would so yeah okay. I mean the, so the change would be to remove it for the twenty five and under. I'm 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 fine with that. I think that's that makes a lot of sense. Um, the term limits. Um, I, I would suggest that we just keep the term limits as they are and with the understanding that you know people will leave if they need to but if they're able to stay that's better and so you know let's not uh, put an additional piece of red tape to have ha you know make us re-vote on that if they're gonna stay I'm, I'm with 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 what uh, councilmember Mink just said okay so we would be removing the Citizen Academy requirement only for the under the, the, the younger of the, the two. two. The younger of the two Correct. younger members, yes. Okay, and that's the under 25. So yeah. we're, we're, Correct. we're keeping the current age, you know, we have the under 25 and we have the 25 to, to uh, sorry, 26 to 35. Yeah. Correct. That is staying. Yes. Yeah. Are we introducing a new, the, the student requirement is gone, that yes. that's off the table? Right, but you, I think it would be helpful to clarify in there that there's a young adult and a youth member, but with the parameters that they have just discussed where the youth member can be up to age 25. Okay. Um, and the young adult member is 25 to 36. 20, it's 26 to 36 35, to 35, sorry. So is that a, cha is that a, to clear is that a change no, to clarify? It's, no. it's what okay. it is now. Okay, yeah. It's what it is now, but they're not defined and I, want we'd like those to be defined in the definition section so that okay. that's straightforward okay. okay next please the next would be the uh amendments the amendment number two would be would relate to Actually, we've cut, we've cut, we've captured two and three. So let's. Uh, the next amendment would be the uh, institutional members. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Go ahead. The the current current arrangement is we have the institutional members who uh, have the term institutional members is is just for ease is something that we put in for drafting purposes. But these are the police chief and the and the police union so I guess the the voting requirement that they would be uh, they are currently ex official members so they have they are reserved a seat on the Commission but they are not voting members so I the next decision point is whether they should now be voting members Did you yeah I mean we just we just sat here and had a hearing right before this talking about the difficulties in recruiting law enforcement members. Um, we have not done a good job as a community in both saying we need and want positive 21st century policing models, and yes, also we want you here. Um, and I know that, that not everybody does, and some folks would like for them to just disappear. Um, but I think it sends the wrong message, particularly at a time of extreme need in our community, where, as you heard, response times to calls for service have suffered, that we say, you come, but you can't talk and you can't vote. I don't think that sends a positive collaborative uh, message to the body as a whole. And by only having two votes, again, out of a 15 member body, there's no way that two votes are going to upend the entire apple cart. But it does say we're treating every voice here as one that matters to this discussion. Um, so I'm firm on that. I know my colleagues may differ, but that's where I am. Thank you. We're going to hear from Councilmember Juwando and Chair uh, yes. uh, Sterling. I saw your hand up as well. Thank you. And but yours, I didn't know if you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah. please. Um, I appreciate that. And as I said in my opening, I, this one is, 
unfortunate in that I think it is driving something that is not actually the case and happening. And I'm sure the members of the PAC will talk about the PAC meetings I have participated in either virtually otherwise the police in the union are very involved. They are talking, they are engaged in the conversation. Um, uh, they're not asked to sit there and, and be quiet as was suggested. Um, and I think again, the police, just as they did in this session and do in every public safety session and before the council have multiple venues and a enormous amount of influence on the policy for their department and how council members view it. Um, and one of the things I pushed when I got on this council was to have more other voices included when we talked about things that impact the public like public safety or policing. Uh, and so I, I just, the suggestion that this is silencing or diminishing that voice when there every other venue is set up to amplify that voice uh, uh, is, is incorrect. And this again is the advisory committee on policing um, the, from the community. The whole goal of this bill is to hear from the community. They're the ones, the vo votes and the voices that we need. Uh, and, again, and, and again, in that, they've been very gracious and, and the police have been participatory in those meetings, as I'm sure you'll hear. So I, I think I, I, the suggestion is wrong, the reality of it is wrong, uh, and this amendment is, is wrong, and, and we, should, we shouldn't put it forward. Please, Mr. Chair Sterling, please. Thank you, Chairman Katz. Um, Councilmember Lickie, you had said that there's confusion about their role. And I'm interested what the evidence is. There isn't been any confusion on the commission about their role. There's never been a confusion with the chief of police or the representative of the bargaining unit. They are present. They seek recognition. We invite their recognition. They speak on almost every question. They have come. We often have several officers, uh, several civil in the administration uh, representing the chief if the chief is not present. There's never been a meeting when they have not participated in terms of their voices being heard. The voting, however, is a very different matter in the, in the and I think that we, that the, their role very much is a support role for the commission, for the, for the voices of the people in talking about them, in talking about their concerns. You said it, it, in your remarks a moment ago that we want a positive 21st century policing. That's certainly what the commission wants. The commission has repeatedly pressed the police department about their data analysis, about their 21st century management about record keeping, about transparency. We bring forward issues that are critical in an analytical way and we benefit from hearing their voices. They're constantly informing us and when they can't answer a question or explain, we're aware of that. But so my, my bottom line is that having them as equal voting members completely changes the character of the relationship, I believe and one that doesn't strengthen the role of the commission for the purpose of gathering the, the information and providing advice to the county council for the council to carry out its oversight role. Thank you, Mr. McKinney, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would again begin by saying this, utilizing the word integrity. Integrity is important, whether you have it or not. And this commission is supposed to have the integrity of being a voice for the community. And its very creation was done because there was concern about the ability of policing, not just in this county, but across this country, to be done in a fair and equitable way. And to allow now this body that was created for the purpose of the public to have a voice, to change that and now say that we're going to have the very entity that we voice concerns about, and I say concerns, now we're going to have them vote. So what does that do to the integrity of this body? Should we allow that to happen? I've been in and out of uniform as a law enforcement person for 40 some years. The police are not lacking in voice in terms of making sure 
that this body or any other body is aware of what their needs are. I sat this morning and I listened to that distinctly. So what we need to do now is exactly what Councilman Juwando just spoke of. I understand he's not a part of this body, but he was a part and a significant part in its creation. So what I want, would like to see this body do is not undermine the good work that it has already done and you, you stand on the cusp of doing that with that one change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Jawanda used, I think it was you, they used the term gracious, that you were gracious to allow, and I don't believe we should be gracious to allow the police to participate. I believe- The police were gracious. Or the, I, well, okay. however, I, I believe that, that there needs to be a definite, um, appreciation for uh, their, their commenting on or giving advice for or, or uh, discussing with uh, the, the, the colleagues on the uh, Advisory Commission on Policing. I'm going to get used to saying that, that title rather than the, new the old title. And I do believe that the police would have the opportunity and should take the opportunity that once the uh, ACP gives their their thoughts that they comment on the comments that they come back and say you know what I think this is a good idea or come back and say I don't think it's a good idea but I I do agree that we need to have them at the table I think they need to feel welcome at the table I believe that they need they are welcome at the table and I believe that they that there's no need for them to actually vote because they should be, for the word, wrong word, removed from the vote so that they feel free to comment positively or negatively. So I'm okay with leaving it the way it is as long as it continues to be clear, and I'm, and I'm using the word continues, that it continues to be clear that they are a part of this group. Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Yes. I'm sorry, may I interject one thing just for your consideration? Sure. I mean, again, I'm looking at this from the operational perspective. Um, Mr. Sterling and Mr. McKinney have been fabulous chair and co-chair, and they have proactively solicited police mm -hmm. input the entire time. I will say the initial chair and vice chair specifically excluded police yeah, from subcommittee membership. They did. And, you know, it, you can't, you don't know who's going to be appointed in subsequent PACs and whether or not that relationship will stay as strong as it is under the current chair and vice chair. And I just wanted to put that out there to complicate matters even further. So. Well, thank you for complicating everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Mr. Sterling. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, Ms. Ross, thank you, thank you very much for those compliments for Vice Chair McKinney and myself. The, it is worth noting that this was a completely new entity being created at the time and that and the, and, and I would say that trying to start in the midst of a pandemic where we never actually yeah. met in person yeah. was a very, very challenging one for the, for the commission. And that um, the, um, I think that every institution, every body uh, begins to evolve from its earliest um, uh, uh, stages, and and I think that we're we are setting a pattern of relationship in in the last couple of years that I don't think that there is a problem with. Is we when we, we frequently will send a communication to the police and we get detailed responses back in the form of questions and answers. And that, you know, there is both that as a formal dialogue and then the, the at, our, at our monthly meetings, of course, they're, they're, there's, they're always present and speak. I, I, you know, I, I have to compliment um, uh, the chief and his delegates and Sergeant Brewer, who represents the bargaining unit, for repeatedly and invaluably um, contributing to our understanding of, of matters that we're discussing. There, there's no sense that they're not welcome. There's no sense that their thoughts are disregarded. There's no sense that their thoughts aren't um, deeply appreciated uh, in the meetings when they're made. 
and 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 I, I, I and I thank thank uh, Ms. Farage for her, for her comments about about this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just um, and I and I thank you, Ms. Farage, for pointing out sort of how things started. And I am greatly appreciative that that's not where they are presently in terms of excluding them from serving on committees. But I definitely, I mean, obviously, I'm going to vote differently than my colleagues here um, on the vote issue, but that we are setting a clear legislative intent that they are not to be excluded or precluded from participation in any way, shape, or form, even if the committee votes two to one, no, no voting rights, um, that that won't happen again because they are not, the, the committee does have staff assigned to it. Mm -hmm. the, the MCPD executive and FOP representatives are not staff to the committee. They are supposed to be members. And I want to make sure that that distinction carries forward regardless of who's at the helm. I know you've done your best to make that work, but I want to make sure that we are very clear that that needs to stay that way regardless of who is chairing this committee and who its members are. I, if, and I appreciate what you're saying, I, if there could be, and I, I'm, I don't believe that they should vote, but I believe it should be clear that they are allowed to participate or are a part of the committee just as any other committee member are. I don't, you're going to have to wordsmith this, please. But I do believe that it should be without question that they are uh, not excluded from conversation. Uh, Chair Katz, the, the, the current language says the commission you know, will have this many members. So the, the only distinction that is made is with regard to the voting. So, okay. even, so even even with no they further... They are considered members, they are members. non-voting members, yeah. please. Is exactly. That, yeah, is that I, your point, Ms.? Yeah, that, that's part of my point. I just want to be clear that um, um, initially our, first of all, okay, um, the, the subcommittee structure that we use has evolved significantly since since we began. You know, the subcommittees we have now are not the subcommittees we had then, okay? Um, the, the, um, the, the makeup of the subcommittees has been um, based on interest. Now, at, as I recall, we have had like three or four subcommittees at, at various times. That's been sort of the 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 way it's gone um but but um but we only have two two folks from the police so it's 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 kind of going to be unlikely that a police uh representative or a member of the police force either of the ex officio members would would be able to be they'd be doing double duty in in a lot of instances and and we've been pretty clear in trying to make sure that the folks who are on the commission, everybody is only signed to one subcommittee because you know we try to be respectful of people's time. So it, it's I don't think it's I I don't um, I don't I do not recall ever having a vote at which we banned ex officio members from any committee. Okay, that just that is not my recollection. I, that did not happen. So, so as to prior practice, um, I can tell you that um, that that is not current practice. Um, that is probably practice that out of our three years, maybe happened like for about six, seven months, if that. So this is, you know, we 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 really have to be very cons. We, we have to be, um, we have to make sure that the tempest does not become, um, does not leave the teapot. And, and this is not the kind of thing that, that is, was ever a big deal. At every meeting I've ever been to, the views of the ex officio members were not only sought after, they, they were usually a main part of the program, you know. So, so this is there. There was not this um, this exclusion. I just I need to be very clear about that. Thank you, Councilmember 
Mink and then Mr. McKinney. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, to again, it, it's been said, but I wanted to emphasize again that I, I'm trying to really respect the fact that this was legislation that was very recently discussed in front and voted on unanimously at the full council following extensive public input and extensive conversation amongst council members uh, you know in this room and and in this committee and so I am very and, and it, this like just happened quite recently so I'm very hesitant to make any kind of big changes here because it just went through the democratic process um, and so you know it, I think it's understandable that some some kinks were worked out in terms of you know subcommittee membership and that sort of thing um, but you know we don't go into our other commissions and like micromanage who gets assigned to which subcommittee you know, ex officio or, or non um, there's always going to be you know people who want to be on this subcommittee or that and we leave it up to you know the chairs and the vice chairs and the members to um, work that out in a reasonable fashion as adults and it sounds like that's what happened here and that it's now working and we're receiving you know the having the conversation is being had at the table that needs to be had that um, uh, you know input is being given from those ex officio members so uh, you know I'm not seeing a reason to mess with this and without a really compelling reason I, I don't think that we should be going in and making changes thank you mr. McKinney um, yes uh, council member Mink I certainly appreciate that uh, in no way doing certainly not doing the tenure that I've had here that the police have been in any way dismissed uh, been deemed to be undesirable what you have to keep in mind is that any police department across the country it's an authoritative body and as such any organization or other entity that has some kind of influence that could possibly affect it can be deemed to be somewhat oppositional whether that is true or not but the thing we have to really concern ourselves with is that perception is reality and the last thing we want to happen is for the public to have a perception that this is not a fair body where their voices will be legitimately heard and that information will be related to you. Thank you. Thank you. So are we, and I know it's going to be a two-one vote, but are we, are we clear on what we're doing here? Uh, so I, when the decision is not unanimous, I do have to record. Uh, I have this down for whether to change to voting or non-voting, it's two to one. Council Member Luki wants to, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, then the next decision point would be the appointment and whether the appointment of commissioners should be by the full council or whether it should be by, uh, of course, appointment is by the full council, but whether yeah. the nomination should be by each council member. I, I think this one has gotten nice and confused. It was never, and, and we have Ms. Branson sitting here, and she's going to correct me. It's, it's never if I'm wrong, it's when I'm wrong, but, but it was always that each individual council member nominated the word is nominated and that nomination went to the full council and i think it was council member Juwanda that mentioned that six well in those days it was five needed to vote for that person to be on this on this uh what is now called the advisory commission on policing and and I believe that that is what should continue to happen. It is not that each council member gets to appoint somebody to this board. The individual council members can't do that. They can nominate, but each council member nominated. And I think that's necessary. Now where it got nice and more confusing was when a person left the commission, all of a sudden somebody said, well, we need somebody new, you know, let's vote on this new person. They didn't go back to the original council member and say, by the way, you are, go ahead. Actually, you did. Yeah. You did go back yes. to the original? Yeah. I don't remember that part then. But at, at any rate, what, whatever that person who left still should go back to, just like you said we did, go back to the original council member and say, look, your, your nominee just left. You, you need to nominate somebody else. So that, I, I'm comfortable with that. Can I just speak a little yeah, bit on how that sure. functions internally since I'm staff? Yes. When it's, a, dis, when it's a, a nominee by one of the district council members, it's very easy to get either that current district council member to reappoint or nominate 
um, or that person's successor. Chair Katz, you are term limited. You are not going to be here in four years. So three. your successor, three. I'm sorry, three. <laughs> He's so, got a countdown <laughs> clock going. Yeah. So your successor, if your nominated position becomes vacant, your successor can easily make that nomination. But for the at-large members, it becomes problematic because in a, in a next election, perhaps if two or more at-large members do not win again or just choose not to run again, and in the interim, one of those PAC members resigns, then we don't know who um, should be the nominee. And the other thing that I'll bring, um, since this council, which I highly respect, is very engaged in transparency and, and being open and forthright to the public, this process has not been done publicly historically. And if you do go to the one council member, one nominee, I think that should be a public process. I know of at least that. one PAC commissioner who thought they were nominated by one council member and turns out that was not the case. And I just think that it would be something that the public would like to, to understand the process for. And I agree with that part. I do think that it's, um, you know, it, it's more difficult for the at-large members and, you know, how these things would ha change. However, if if there are since there's four at large if if the uh, person if two of the at large members pe uh, people remained on the commission so that would mean that the two new members of the who were at large they would have the discussion about who would nominate and who wouldn't i think it could be worked out i really do so can i just ask yeah. a clarifying question um and you're the one who's been staffing this the whole time but we've had as I understand it, ongoing issues where people, like in the best case scenario, the folks stay for their three years and then maybe want to stay on more and they've expressed that intent to, um, to the council. Um, but that's not been the case and what we've had are a lot of churning positions and then a lot of disconnect in getting them refilled with new people by the one person, one assignment kind of rule and then we had the 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 executives for members can you walk us through over the past three years how this has played out in terms of actual membership and um so we can think this through appropriately and logistically again with the transparency issue too because i i have some trouble with people thinking, well, I'm appointed by this person, I'm there to serve that person's policy agenda, which should not be the case, right? It should be the body appointing um, and need to make that, that clear. So it doesn't come into effect, obviously, for the executive appointments, and those have been, they, won't, they weren't the majority of the vacancies. Most of the vacancies so far on the council side have been district. Um, for the one at-large member, that at-large member was still serving. So that at-large member um, went through the inner, you know, the application list and determined um, which person he or she wanted mm -hmm. to nominate. And this, quite frankly, it was circulated to chiefs of staff to see how other council members felt, right? And so then that would be put forward for an, for a vote in public. Um, I think it would be helpful if the actual nomination process were more public. I mean, you're saying the actual nomination. So first off, we'd advertise that we need someone to fill a position that's that's been vacated, right? And then have that discussion in public. I I have no problem with that. I think that's that's the way we should be doing business. And so, are you? So, okay. So can we clarify what this would be? What's being proposed at this point? The I mean, the proposal on the table is that are we keeping, it's my understanding that we'd be keeping the arrangement where every council member nominates right. um, okay. a member. Um, the only change then would be to make it 11 as opposed to the current nine. But I think it has yeah. to be clear because we've, we've, I, we've, I've heard it said that, that each council member appoints and that's not and that's correct. That's not accurate. No, right. It, it's each council member nominates, nominates. Mm -hmm. and that the body in general, uh, uh, you know, just like we do in any committee, right. uh, uh, votes on the appointment. And that's how it's written currently in the law right now, right? 
So we're, we're good except for the addition of Correct. Two cents. And, you know, I'll go back and review it if, if there's any room for any further clarification. Uh, you know, it, right. it may be redundant, yeah. but right. maybe it's worth that's spelling out again. Yeah, I think we just want clarity to make sure that everybody's on the same page about that, that it's not an individual council member appointing one of the 11. And, of course, you need to change the number from 9 to 11. But um, that that's clear yeah. that it's the body yeah. that appoints, not the individual members. Okay. Correct. Next one, please. The next change would be, um, so this is kind of going back to the, w when we talked about the youth okay. member. We're good. I'm sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Sorry. When we talked about the youth member, we exempted, uh, there was unanimous agreement in exempting the youth member. This is the one that's under 25 from the requirement to participate. So the members of the commission are required to go through the Citizens Academy. Right. The youth member unanimously has been exempt from that requirement. For the people who, for the, the rest, who have to go through the Citizens mm -hmm. Academy, failure to do so within, one of the amendments is proposed by Council Member Luki, is that if they fail to do so within one year, that there would be an automatic um, uh, suspension. Yes, yeah. th like they would be removed from the um, Commission, so that's that's a decision point. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean this this was completely born out of experience, right? And what actually played out. Again, recognizing that during the pandemic there may have been roadblocks getting in the way, but we're not living in that situation now. And we need to make it clear that you're assuming you're applying to be on this commission. You want to serve on this commission. This is a requirement. It's not any different than the types of things, as I read earlier, that are imposed under state law for the actual, the civilian oversight disciplinary bodies. Please, Mr. Stern. I believe, I'm not aware that there were uh, members who did not participate, and I think the word in the legislation is participate. I don't believe completion is the word that's currently in the law. And that participation was in, provided to members of the public to participate virtually, and in addition to some members of the then PAC participating virtually, other members of the public were participating virtually in the Citizens Academy. Uh, Ms. Farag could probably clarify um, actual and participation. It was my understanding that they were supposed to attend and complete it and that that is not, did not occur. No. I think the, the, the legislative intent when the amendment was offered assumed completion of the Academy um, because it was That's COVID true. and it was a brand new pack. They offered um, everything online uh, there was a real Citizen Academy, which Mr. Sterling attended online. I believe Ms. Hudson attended online. But the department also provided like five or six meetings that all of the PAC could go to, and it was just the PAC, and they were hitting on the, the larger points like use of force and stuff. The Citizen Academy can be an important tool for the PAC because there are 18,000 different police departments. They're all subject to different county state laws, right? So it's, they do operate a little bit differently each, and it was good for individuals to understand how the county police departments were working. But there is that, that potential to do a modified five class um, offering. Um, it was recorded and so the police department tracked who actually attended in person. There was an honor system of who watched that afterwards and there's no way to track who did that. And there was probably half chose to do it that way. Um, just a point of, no, please. Uh, a point of clarification at line 68 of the draft bill that is the requirement on the citizens academy it says citizens academy participation the public members appointed under paragraph c must participate in the montgomery county police department citizens academy we're adding the language now to exempt the youth member but it does use the term participate so i guess i would i would say if you want to if what you want is completion, then maybe we should say so. Yeah, I, I, my intent is that they complete it. Um, Council Member Mink, mm -hmm. oh, and then Mr. Sterling. Um, can I acknowledge Ms. Branson as well? And Ms. Branson, and, and, please, I'm sorry. And, and then I'll, if, if you two would like to, to comment on that, that would be great, and then I'll follow you. Yeah, Let me right. just okay. say that I think it, it is really important to remember uh, first of all, I would suggest we keep the participation language because no matter what we may want to happen, COVID's not really over. 
Um, and 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 I really think it's important that we are cognizant of the fact that not everybody in this county, you know, lives a, a suburban two car world. Okay, people have getting out there is quite a hurdle for folks, and and as we as we place these kind of transportation and time based requirements that's really what this is then we are diminishing the potential for people who are likely to be moderate income marginalized and who may not be able to meet those requirements that undermines exactly who we're supposed to be serving here who we're supposed to be listening to here and and so i i would i would hope that you could find it best to keep the participation um in there and to also require a modified um because i think that was part of our uh the negotiation that we had to have with the police was to have a modified version that folks could actually go to online they could look up you know when it helped them i mean you know uh a young mother trying to trying to arrange babysitting to get out to the gaithersburg and take three buses i mean this is just this is it it undermines our real intent of figuring out how we expand civic participation. So I'm asking you to consider the very practical nature of this thing and the and the practical nature of people's lives. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. If I could, isn't the Citizens Academy hybrid? It's hybrid. It's been hybrid since COVID started and it continues to be. Okay. And they can still attend 100% virtually, correct? Yes. Yep. All right. So, Mr. Sterling. Mr. Sterling, and then I saw Mr. McKinnon, and then we're getting back to you. You, you gave up your slot there. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, um, if you'll forgive me, I wanted to help resolve the prior question regarding nominations. And there, what I was left confused with was the language to address it. And what my suggestion might be on line 27 of the bill, there be two sentences. The nominations will be recorded if a member leaves, the council member who nominated the member may nominate a successor. Nominate, yes, not confirm. Nominate a successor, yes. that is what I said, yes. 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 Mm -hmm. So the, the nominations will be, and this will be on line 27 after the reference to nominations. Right. Mm -hmm. The nominations will be recorded if a member leaves, the council member who nominated the member, that would be the member who leaves, may nominate a successor. Or would nominate a successor. Should we clarify that it's the, the council member for that di the because it might not be the same person, right? So it should district, be for right. that district or the at large member may nominate. You know that if the, the and Mr. Coney can the, wordsmith the, it, but the, the count yeah. the council member who nominated or their successor. Yeah, correct. Yeah, there we go. Right. The council member who nominated the member or the council member's successor. Mm -hmm. Ms. Coney, are you okay with that one? I am good. Thank you, Mr. I am. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. I got the name wrong. <laughs> yeah, go oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman and Council, um, I would just like to add to the issue regarding the attendance of the police academy by the uh, student representative or youth. And what I will say about that is that experience, yes, is invaluable. I used to teach at the academy myself, so I know how valuable that knowledge and information is. However, the thing that we're seeking from young people is the rawness of their voice, what their experiences are and the experiences of their fellow youth. Yeah. So to eliminate that, I think, would be a bigger uh, problem than insisting upon their attendance at the academy. So I would just like this body to take that under consideration. Yeah, we are. Go, ahead. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Um, Thank you. Actually, speaking of the um, that seat um, that we're, I think we're clarifying the name of it. Did we go back and did we call it a student seat or a youth seat for the twenty-five and under? Youth. Or, or youth. 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 Okay, great. Thanks. Because you don't necessarily have to be a student. Right. 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 Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I just want to echo what Ms. Branson said about how we're, we're trying to make sure that we have people there who are from the communities who are most impacted, and I don't want to put anything in the way that could potentially um, hinder that. It sounds like we are getting a good faith effort from folks to participate. I would not want to add any um, you know, formal consequences in on, on top of that, um, especially without an understanding of if there are folks who are not completing it, why are they not completing it? because I, I would think that it's very likely some of the issues that we have heard raised here today, and in which case, um, you know, that tells us that we should rethink the requirement and, and or provide um, more accessible, um, you know, shorter compact versions or, you know, th things that are timestamp, things of that nature to make it more accessible to them as opposed to just being punitive about it. So if there's concerns about people not being able to access the information that are, uh, you know, that's provided there, then I think that is a conversation that would be great for the body to have and uh, let us know or let NCPD know what would be helpful in making sure that that information is accessible to folks a as they need it. Um, I don't know that it solves the problem that we're getting at here to put something punitive into into the law. So I, I would I would prefer to not have that in there. Can I can I also just yeah no I I, I still think if you know if you're if you're struggling to be able to complete the requirements and you're struggling to make the meetings. Then you might not have you might not have been an appropriate candidate to serve, and um, you know, like I said, this is baked into state law for state public bodies. I am I mean, obviously, you guys feel differently. That's okay, but then I still would prefer to have that requirement there for members. Please, may, may I add? Uh, circling back, actually, to a point I had raised at the introduction, I had said if you do decide to have this requirement of removal for failure to complete the Citizen Academy, I was suggesting some due process language, and that was to address any hardships. So just by way of analogy, for instance, the BCC article in the code has removal requirements. There's actually automatic removal for someone who misses a certain number of consecutive meetings, but there's built into that some due process. So for instance, your, your seat will be vacate, your, your position on the commission on the BCC, um, you lose that after 30 days from when you're notified so you're told this is why it's due to absence. And you have the opportunity to request a waiver. It could be that you were absent because you were undergoing treatment or you know, had some medical emergency. So that's the due process I was uh, suggesting earlier, that if, you know, if, that, um, if that helps or just something for the committee to consider. Yeah, if that's already in the board's committee and commission's general article, then there should just be a cross-reference to that and follow that procedure that you already have. The procedure under the BCC section is specifically for attendance. So I would say if, if, if we're going to do it, if we're saying failure to attend the Citizens Academy you know, means you lose your position, then I might just say there should be this, op uh, it's just a recommendation. Yeah, you could use the parallel language from, from that and put it over here since it's, you're right, it's different from attendance. I'd be okay with that. I, I am comfortable with that. I, I believe that if someone in the, we should use the word participate. I don't know that we have to use the word complete, but, but we should use the word participate. I'm comfortable that if someone has a reason that they were unable to, and, and I'm assuming that you get a 30-day notice and the person says, you know, I'm gonna go back and they can look at the, at the various uh, uh, tapings and whatnot and, and say that I've, that they're participating. Isn't that what you're saying? That's what I was referring to as due yeah. process, so that it's not I, automatic I, that there's an opportunity I'm, I'm to be heard. Go ahead, please. Uh, if, we're, if we're keeping the word participate, um, then I'm slightly more comfortable with it. I, I mean, I do think that, you know, participation in a, uh, participation in the meetings themselves is just a different thing than participating, you know, in any kind of, you know, training or, you know, I think that's why it gets special recognition across the board. And I think that that makes sense. And I don't know why we would, uh, it, it feels like a, a solution in search of a problem here. You know, I don't, I don't know that we need to add a, additional or elevate additional um, requirements or suggestions to the same level as participation in the meetings of the body that's been established. That is its own unique and, and critically important thing. And so that's why that is addressed. It sounds like, you know, participation is not an, an issue. Everyone's making a good faith effort to, to um, you know, do the best that they that they can there, and and there's efforts to make that more accessible, which I think is 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 great. Um, so uh, again, I just I don't see a, a need to add additional potentially, you know, 
paperwork or red tape for somebody to have to go up and now people have to turn in their thing or you know and somebody has to go through that due process I, you know I, I just don't see a need here to be adding extra work for anybody for something that seems like it's already already functioning but it is a requirement now that they participate uh, in, in the Academy. Yeah, correct. Academy. Correct. And, and I'm and I'm comfortable, you know, and that's fine. But I don't think that we need to add a whole like due process thing. It sounds like people are doing it. So, so at present, they they must participate in the academy. There's no consequence spelled out for not participating, and the proposal is to introduce um, a consequence with, as being suggested here, with due process. With, due, with yeah. following the due process. I, I'm I'm fine with that. So with the change from complete to participate, which is really what is there now. Yeah, I think we're on a two to one. I would like the word complete there on participate, yes, right? Yes. And so that's that decision point. And then with respect to the having a consequence, are we two one or right. are you three? Two one. Two, and we're two one two on the, two ones. On the um, consequence with due process language for failure to participate. Mr. Sterling, please. Is the committee interested in defining what participate means if there's going to be a consequence that who would initiate the removal to say you've not participated? It, it would be a, I'm just my understanding of Susan's position Ms. operationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ms. Frog doesn't have enough to do. So, yes, go ahead, please. Uh, and I'll just say you know, it was an 11th hour amendment when yeah. this bill was passed, and so the, the wordsmithing may not have been crafted precisely. The legislative intent, in my recollection, was completion of the Citizen Academy. I know that the first council president, who I checked in with almost weekly, was very adamant that people complete the Citizen Academy. Um, so, you know, if you, you want to leave it to each council president, that's fine. I, I'm, well, just, I'm be, agnostic about that. It wouldn't that. be the each you. council president. It would be that they, that there would be some. The, 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 I, I'm, I'm asking rather than saying. But if someone uh, had wanted a due process, what happens for the due process? So the analogy, which is uh, the analogy taken from the attendance. Let's say if someone had missed three consecutive meetings under the BCC article. They, they would lose their seat. But they first have to get a letter telling them, right. you're going to lose your seat on this date. Then they have 30 days to, to request a, re or yeah. request a waiver. They could write back and say, this is the reason why I didn't participate. So that's the, that is the due process piece. And, and, and I guess Ms. Frog is the one who tracks, is that? For the Citizen Academy, both the police department track and I track. And so, can I ask who who would one request a waiver from? Who would be the deciding authority? I go ahead. I believe, Ms. Branson, that you had gotten the waiver to participate on the Park and Planning Commission. I got it from the council president. There you go. That's so. So, so nice. and 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 you know, as you recall, that was a unique situation. So it wasn't written any place. So so. So that should be included in the law that the waiver requests would be made to the council president. Is that because I, I don't I don't think that happens anyplace else. Here's here's my ultimate point that by elevating this participation requirement to something that one can be removed for, you have elevated it to the same status as the attendance requirement. You know, and and if that's your goal, then you know, so be it. But um, but then, but no one understand that you have now elevated the number of things a person must do. I think we're required under the law to have six meetings a year, and let's assume arguendo that these um, various sessions comprise five different meetings. So now, now you've you've and, and we never have had six meetings a year. We, we have monthly meetings. So now instead of having um, someone who is signing up to do something 12 times a year, you're signing up automatically to do something 17 or 18 times a year. You, you, you have now really raised the stakes for people. Isn't that the way it is now? 
that in, in, isn't there a requirement now that you had to attend the police academy? It was, Citizens Academy? It was not a requirement, quote unquote. What? It was a um, be, because of the, or the participation. Yes, you had to participate. Yeah, okay, but this that's a requirement different. now. It, it is a yeah. it it is not a requirement that can get you removed. And, and that's what you're about to make it, a requirement right. that can get you removed. But that's kind of at the, I mean, you know, to, to Council Member Jawando's earlier point, he said, you know, we should be doing things that strengthen, not weaken. Don't dilute. Well, if you're not. It depends on what you think strengthen means. I don't think he meant strengthen in terms of making it more difficult for people. I think he meant strengthen in terms of assuring greater participation for more people. I think that if you're talking about participation, active participation, being invested in this process, again, if this is all clear, this is what this is and this is what you're signing up to do and I am applying to serve on this commission and I feel passionately about this topic, then you're going to make every effort to do the things that are required of you in order to have that robust discussion and be able to provide that advice to the body. At the end of the day, if people are not actively participating and yet then you know they're trying to advise us but they're only partially participating, we have problems. That's that's not as useful for this body, the council as a body, to receive information from folks who, who are there sometimes, not all the time, can't meet the attendance requirements of the board's committees and commission's general provision. And with respect to participating in the Citizens Academy, I had believed that it was meant that they actually complete it, not that they show up for the pieces they want to. I think that there has to be a level set expectation for every member that is identical. And, and, and by only saying participate and letting them pick and choose cafeteria style, then you're not having a body that's providing advice that has gone through all the same processes and procedures, and that's challenging for me. Council Member Mink, please. Thanks. Um, I, I think that we're getting at, and what we're hearing um, from Ms. Branson is that the, uh, is that the Citizens Academy is a as a as a requirement if we're going to require completion that that is going to exclude a lot of people who we want to be uh, uh, potentially on this body and obviously that runs counter to the existence of this body and everything that we're talking about here today so you know maybe that was the maybe that was the intent of the previous council in that you know 11th hour past amendment and maybe we should have had a longer there should have been a longer conversation about that maybe this is one of these moments where if we're going to make a change um then we need to really really have a good reason and what we have is some um, input some experience from members of this body who have seen there are other members trying to deal with the you know deal with uh, you know attendance of these other things. We're getting more information from that and feedback about what that requirement you know how doable that is for the for the membership that we are looking for. And I think that's an important conversation to be having and um, and and great feedback that we're getting. And so I. I would not want to say we definitely got it right, disregard the input that we're getting now and let's make it you know, stricter and impose greater consequences. I think it sounds like an important conversation to have and I think that the follow up from it is gonna be something like we need to make that, maybe if we can first make sure that we are making it far more accessible um, that we are providing a resource that people can turn to uh, that's not time stamped so that they can work around their own family schedules and work schedules, um, making sure that transportation obviously is not an issue. It sounds like it's already hybrid, but the time commitment is a huge issue. And once we are comfortable with having all of those in place, then maybe we return to talk about uh, you know en enforcement and that kind of thing. But I think it would be premature, given what we are hearing um, from members of this body about the about how this could affect, how this would affect likely membership. Uh, I, do not, I do not think that we should be hasty here. I think let's improve the system and then we can return to the conversation. We're gonna have to move on on this uh, discussion, but, but I, where are we right now in, with, the, with the various parts to this one? I believe uh, the various parts of no, the- of, For this topic. Um, on the on the the, the removal requirement, yes. I, what I've heard is Councilmember Loki 
uh, wants the word completion and that there would be a consequence mm -hmm. accepting the due process mirroring mm -hmm. the language in attendance and what I'm hearing is that council member Mink is a that's a no but you were okay with the word participation right Right, I'm okay with keeping the word participation, but I do not think that this is the time to look at imp imposing additional consequences because we haven't worked out something to, to ensure that we already know that it's not accessible to everybody who's trying to do it. So okay. we need to fix that first. But I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not understanding how it's not accessible if the body itself meets on Zoom and the academy is also available on zoom it's because it's many many additional hours and so when we're looking at people who are working multiple jobs who have kids all of those things those commitments they sign on to make sure that they can be present at those meetings which they are but we're asking them now uh, to to take on a, a much greater amount of their time to put into this body and they're not able to do it most people are not going to be able to do it so this is going to limit uh, who even applies to be on it and it's going to potentially then get some people kicked off of it if they think that they can do it but they find that they can't we need to figure out how to make it accessible um, time wise and work with MCPD to come up with the resources that we need there and then I think we can potentially return to this conversation but what I'm hearing is that it would be premature to impose that right now and would have adverse consequences on the fundamental intent of this bill or so of the of the of the original bill if, if I may just recap so the current the current provision has the word participate yeah. Um, and maybe let's take this in pieces. So, we, we're keeping the word participate, or we're changing it to complete. That sounds like it's I, a. It's I, a. I'm fine with participate. participate. So it's two. So that's a two, two one, one on, on the participate. Side. Okay. The next piece, which is the actual amendment on the that was proposed, is whether fading to participate because that's the, fading to participate leads to removal. Correct. And what's the vote on that? Is that you know to to Ms. Branson's point, I I I believe that that there should be someone should if someone is is being told that they didn't do what they were supposed to be doing, then I believe that the that they should be able to correct what they've been told they should be doing. If if you're received notice and says, oh by the way, you didn't, you're supposed to be participating. In, in this police and the uh, Citizens Police Academy, and you didn't do it, you got to participate. And if that person doesn't do that, then they are, didn't fulfill their obligation when they were appointed. Having said that, what I thought was we were being fair, more fair, and, and perhaps we weren't, it, by saying, but if you have a reason that you couldn't participate, please let us know. I, you know, I thought that the due process was fair, but Candidly, I, I don't know that, that once someone is told they should be fulfilling their obligation to participate, that doesn't mean they have to complete it. It means they have to participate. And I think that's, that's good enough, I guess. Okay. So I'm recording that as a, we're keeping the wording participate and that there's no, the, 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 it's a two one on whether to have the consequence. Correct. Yeah. And, and I have a feeling this is going to be more of a conversation again at, at full council because this, the, the idea that there would be participation in the police, uh, Citizens Police Academy was what now Vice President Freitson's suggestion and I think someone said it was the 11th hour and it was. So I have a feeling that it's going to come back up for conversation, but we're not going to solve it any more than way we just solved it today. So just to recap for the chair, some additional decisions that have to be made. One yep. is uh, on the membership in terms of whether to expand this to include businesses and um, I, I, HOAs. We also have some additional decision points on whether to have staggering term limits. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have a decision point on whether uh, when, when correspondence comes to the uh, even I have to remember the new name, Advisory Commission on Policing, <laughs> whether there's an oblig you know, the, um, uh, whether this must be forwarded to the PAB, and because there's a, one, one of the provisions in here is that, um, you know, that the, the commission must not accept complaints involving right. misconduct. Right. I think there's a proposed amendment by Council Member Mink that this 
that they must forward this to PAM. And I'm fine with that. If, the, if, if a citizen comes and accidentally sends it to this body and it's supposed to be at the other body, you know, collectively on behalf of the county, we should be doing the best we can to get it to where it actually needs to and be to be resolved. And that citizen, that's what you want. And because of the name change, it should be less confusing Correct. for the citizens. Uh, it, it, please, Ms. Stern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to note, that has not yet arisen as a problem. Right. We, in fact, spent a great deal of time at the time that the PAB was created discussing how can we help support communicating to the public that the PAB is to receive those complaints and it's not our responsibility. We, we spent a lot of time discussing that. We, and yeah. I can assure you that should such a thing in fact happen, we would com convey it to, to the PAB. We're not, we're, there's no way in which we would sort of keep it or try to suppress it or handle it ourselves. And I, and I appreciate that, but I also believe you need to have a paper trail. Mm -hmm. that someone needs to be mm -hmm. told, oh, by the way, this is where it is, and that, that they are aware of. Definitely. Right. Yeah. A nice, in writing, warm handoff. Um, and I know the PAB and executive director have gone around to have community forums to make sure they're explaining to the public their processes too, which has been very helpful. But again, you do have, you know, listening to the public as part of the task of this body and engaging with the public. So anything you can do to further facilitate that would be appreciated. Yeah, the forwarding? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So the next decision point is whether um, whether to extend uh, membership to, so this, this criteria, I'm now at circle 51. Uh, so when you're looking at lines 40 onwards in terms of, um, you know, there's, there's a kind, the existing provisions say that the membership of the commission should reflect the range of ethnicity, socioeconomic status, place of origin, and so on and so forth. And so there's an inclusion now uh, in the bill to include representation from business owners or organizations, urban districts, homeowners associations, common ownership communities, and tenants associations. It, it, I, I believe we should leave this as, as simple as we can and not have direct requirements for who can or who cannot apply. Uh, all of the all of the people who are listed here, we should encourage to apply. We should certainly the each uh, council member who has the the right of nomination should keep that in mind and and look at the the other nominees and say you know we, we you know we we have so many from this area and not so many from that area et cetera et cetera. But just to list it and say that somebody has because we don't have somebody who's a, in an HOA, uh, I, I have concerns with. So I think the intent of this was not that we had to have a member from each one of those things. They were additional factors to include along with um, you know, the religion, age, sex, gender identity, orientation, disability, geographic location, and that was because, I mean, we've had concerns raised recently. There was the um, drone as first responder a discussion in Wheaton and one of the owners of the 7-Eleven raised a lot of concerns and, and you know his concerns were that the police didn't handle the situation the way he would want it, it to be handled and our businesses um, our HOAs they are HOAs are formed and organized to help advocate on behalf of communities so it's simply another factor to add in not that we have to have each person tick each box in this list of different things, but that we should, as a body, be mindful of that and in terms of them representing the communities in which they live. Go ahead, please. Um, I, I agree with what Chair Katz said. That I don't think we're looking for, um, the focus is on having historically marginalized people who have disproportionate contact um, with the police or disproportionate use of forces used within those communities. I think, um, I, I respect the intent to make sure that we're keeping these communities in mind. And I think that, you know, we should do that. Uh, but I think that the way it's stated in the bill does reflect uh, the will of that of the council then and now, as well as uh, reflecting the, the input of the community as we put this together. So that'll be 2-1, I guess. I'll record that as a 2-1. to one. The next decision point will be on terms, uh, the terms of the commissioners and whether to stagger the terms. So we had the staggering, and this will get interesting because 
the way it was drafted was so that the the youth member would would be appointed. Well, the youth member was going to have a one term, yes. regardless. They, they one a, a one year term oh, sorry, that could be up term. to three years total. Correct. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. year term. They're already staggering. Um, um, the, the yeah, the intent here was just so you don't have everybody term off at the same I time. Agree with that. Right, just to to allow for that, and I think. And I can't remember whether it was a conversation you and I had, Ms. Ocone, or whether it's in the packet, or maybe you raised it earlier because it's been a hot minute since we started this discussion. Um, but wondering if, for example, someone is in the one-year bracket and then they serve another three years, would they be able to do two? I, I don't. I am indifferent on that. I don't have a preference. My only concern is that you don't want to have anybody. A public body where the entire body turns off at the same time so that that's it in a nutshell yeah and so uh, that was the decision point on staggering um, I, you know I, I think with this body it would be wonderful if we got to the point that not everybody was leaving the same time I think the the problem has been we've had people leaving all the time and and that so I don't know that we should solve that problem today. I think we should say that we're not going to have staggered terms. And if that becomes an issue, I agree. We don't want everybody uh, you know, leaving at uh, the same time. But at this point, that's not the biggest problem we have here. Go ahead, please. Mr. Chairman, with respect, you, in some sense, just described a way to solve the problem, which is when a person is appointed, they are appointed to a three-year term from the time that they start. And as people then leave, their go. successor would get to a three-year term. And if that were the case, we would have already a commission with staggered terms. Sort of an organic. Uh, it would organically yeah, yeah. develop that way. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. I'm, you're okay with that? That, that? that would require an amendment, a further amendment, because right. that's not how it's written now. Right correct. now, if there's a vacancy, the person, the successor Still is named too. for the remainder of the term. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it, it would require an amendment for us to say it would be named for a three year term. In, in I, which case, no, I would also I'm say. I'm okay that, with that. I really which, am. Yep, me too. In which case, I just want clarification on whether, on term limits, because we're saying two terms. Two terms yeah. Are we talking about two? Well, I guess it's a moot point now. If if any time anyone is appointed, it's for three terms. Uh, three, sorry, for three years, three years. not three terms. Yeah, sorry. thank you for confusing us. <laughs> yes, go right ahead. Yeah. <laughs> if they're appointed for three years, should we just say the term limits is two? Uh, which, by the way, is the default under the BCC article. Right. Yes, I'm good with that. Okay, are we? Is that a three zero? Mm, well, I'm fine with the keeping that it's two terms, which is consistent with the BCC's general provisions, but I would prefer the staggered terms. Um, as much as I appreciate my colleague's reference to this happening organically, I think the goal is to, that we don't have that many um, people leaving before the expiration of their term and that it is more concrete. So I would prefer to keep the staggered term language in there, and that's well, a two to one. Two to so. one, yeah. I believe we may have worked our way through. Well, um, I believe you may have worked your way through. I think oh, there's there's sorry, also the one about the oversight. Oh, the exactly. Oversight. Thank you, and thank you to the chair. Is that the what that note was? Was it about the oversight? Is that what that was? I, uh, I believe that we should, we should say that this is not an oversight board. Mr. Sterling and I have had this conversation. I, I do it with the with the utmost respect, but I believe that there is confusion when we say that this board has oversight. I believe people believe that it has oversight over the police. And by the title of the board, by the, by the, um, uh, what we want, this board is an advisory commission on policing to come to the county executive and the county council. It's a committee for them. And so I don't think that we should use the word oversight. I went back and after my good conversations with Mr. Sterling, I looked at civilian oversights of law enforcement on the on uh, the website and I printed out some of it. I mean, I did I did some research. I looked at what Fairfax County does, the closest one, and I believe because of the review board that we now have, the police Account accountability board that we now have, that is an oversight board, but not this one. So I, I do believe there should be clear that that's what we have here. And, and I believe because if we're clear, 
perhaps we would have some people who were uh, uh, not interested in oversight for the police, but are interested in giving advice about the police would, would apply for this board. So that's where I am. Please, I'm sorry. Thanks. Um, so I, I, I agree that there may be some lack of clarity. However, I'm not sure that this solves that particular issue. Um, uh, you know, are we, are we looking at particular legislative authorities that are had or not had? You know, this is, if the, if the intent is just a message kind of to the public or to, I'm not sure who we're sending the message to, but I don't know if this solves it if, because if there's, if there's anything um, concrete that's attached to the word oversight. And I don't believe that there is. So for me, that, that adds more confusion. And, and I'm aware also that, you know, there have been some, uh, uh, you know, instances of um, folks, including in the public, saying, well, are the police required to provide that information that has been requested? Yes or no? And I think if you add this sentence, the answer is yes. And so, but if you add this question, that I think gives more confusion to folks who say, no, they, they don't have to. So my concern is that we're going to further confuse the situation, but I would, um, I would defer to, to you all. Well, let me, to, let me to go chair. to Councilmember Lukey and then to Mr. Stewart. Yeah, so I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I think, you know, certainly the, the body has the ability to request records and things like that. And to the extent that we're adding language that says, that they're not an oversight body. We can add language that says, you know, the department must provide records in accordance with the Public Information Act and cite it there, because that's a 30-day limit, too. Um, so that's already required under state law. We can just cross-reference it, because that is, in fact, the case. This is Sterling. I, I want to refer to OK. A um, couple things. Thank you. Um, the, for the council, is the word oversight defined in, legis in, in the law at all? Is it defined? Uh, in this bill, no. Okay. And that's my point, that the word oversight is not defined. And so, like all undefined things, everybody gets to pour in their thoughts as to what it might mean. So, so let me just tell you, having been an oversight council on Capitol Hill for 20-some uh, years, let me tell you what oversight means to me, okay? Oversight means that you have the ability to review policies and practices of governmental entities to determine whether or not those entities are meeting the uh, appropriations or intended policies of the legislative body. That's what oversight meant. Now, that's not what it means on a county level, I think, okay? And it, it appears that for some people that oversight means that um, there must be some sort of disciplinary or enforcement um, component. That's not what oversight means to me. Um, so, what I'm suggesting to you is that you either A, eliminate the word oversight because it means, it means too many things to too many different people and you end up just confusing things more. That's, that's A. Or B, that you clearly state that this board has the um, authority to review policies, practices, and procedures of the Montgomery County Police in a systemic manner. Because I think part of the problem here is that folks are assuming that we have some sort of power over individuals. We don't, never did, didn't want it. What the goal has always been is to review things on a systemic level to determine whether or not, in fact, maybe there are some policies and practices that are having a disparate result that is unfair. And, and, and it's not only unfair to the citizenry, to the residents, but more importantly, it's unfair to the police.
to the individual officer. If that officer gets a complaint because he is following, following practices that are actually designed to be disparate, well, now that officer's in a jackpot. Does that make any sense? Absolutely not. But, and, and that is the beauty of, of our role here. But let me just take another step back and also be very clear that we should not, this body should not be um, limited to our responses under the Maryland public, uh, under the MPIA, because that's just a whole ball of wax that we shouldn't have to step into um, because it becomes a, a, a bureaucratic and red tape hurdle. If we are a creation of this county council, we should not have to go through that. And, those and, those and, are my 55 things today. And I thank you. I agree with what, what you just said. I don't believe you should have to go through the bureaucratic system. I do believe in your original statement, all the listings that you said, I would add at the end and report to the county executive and the Montgomery County Council as to your determination, your findings, whatever the right words are. Because I think it needs to be clear that that individual police officer that you're talking about, that you're not dealing with them, we don't deal with them, that, that you're dealing with, with the, this body up here. And if we can be clear on that, and, and uh, uh, Ms. Coney is, is very busy I'm sorry. Um, if if we could be clear as to what Ms. Branson said about the various the various points, and that they report to the the county executive and the county council, I I think that might go a, a long way to straighten it out. Mr. Sterling, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would um, would the council feel that in in lieu of the words oversight on page in, in line 108, yeah. where it says not an oversight body, if it said not a regulatory or disciplinary body, would that convey the intent and concern and protection that the council member wishes? Not a regulatory or disciplinary body over any law enforcement agency. Um, that would help. Uh, you know, the term oversight was used because there were members who were using that term and declaring that they were an oversight and they had an oversight function and that was why I chose that word. Um, but the, what you've just proposed would work. It would also be helpful to say, again, they have an advisory function to report to the executive and the council and, and fence that in, as Ms. Branson said, with the, you know, the different things that you could be reviewing in terms of the types of um, best practices you're supposed to be discussing, um, but that you're making sure it's not a compliance body, right? It's not a legal compliance body. It's an advisory body, so. And if I'm not mistaken, earlier on in describing the duties and responsibilities, I think advisory or advising the council is explicitly yes. already it, in the language. It, I'm not. Yes, it, it, it should be. Yeah, it I mean, should already so, be there. So I think that um, I'm okay with what the advantage of allowing regulatory or disciplinary, you're going to hear people use the term oversight because they're going to use it in the common terms and the way in which Ms. Branson had. And I think people would understand that a role in the common meaning of the advisory commission on policing is to serve a, a citizen's oversight role. But it is clearly not a regulatory or disciplinary body. Right. And so I think the goal, by introducing the word oversight, you, have, you create a certain potential for mischief in which the work that we expect this commission to do becomes challenged. That sounds like oversight to me. Well, it is oversight. And so, but it's not regulatory, it's not disciplinary. And, and that's what you want, to, you want to assure the public and everyone and the, and the council itself, the commission itself, that it's not doing that. And right. So that, that's my, respectfully my suggestion as, a, as an amendment to the amendment. Right, and that there wouldn't, I mean, there, because of the existing structure with the other bodies, there wouldn't be the, the reviewing of an individual Precisely. officer's actions. It just would not happen because that's already tasked to others. So. Precisely. I, I am fine with the language that Mr. Sterling just mentioned. That's, that's fine. Not, 
It's not a disciplinary or regulatory Re body. Correct. It's a regulatory disciplinary. You can the order doesn't matter. Are you okay with that? I think we finally got a 3-0 up here. Uh, yeah. Unanimous <laughs> decision on that point that this is not a regulatory or disciplinary body over any law enforcement agency. Okay. Are you uh, done? I, I believe we've covered them all. The last one is pro forma. It's just, it, it's a cross reference to, you know, under the PAB, they're supposed to provide certain reports to the PAC, and so we're just changing the name. Okay. Nice. Um, yes, sir, please. You don't want us to be finished? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, my concern, Mr. Chairman, is the timing. Um, our terms all expire okay. on January 31st. Yep. Um, uh, I invite the council to consider how they want the interim until the appointment of our successors to take place. Do you, I, I think, you know, you know, Ms. Lutzko, you made the point earlier, you don't want this to be, there to be a vacuum and speaking about the term limit suggestion. So we face exactly the problem of not having staggered term limits right now in that our terms are all going to expire. And so yeah. um, m my respectful suggestion is that you continue the terms of the existing member until they are replaced, you know, subsequent to uh, the normal process. So my intent was to make this like what we did with the planning board, right? Which you know, they were they the members were appointed a couple months apart. We did do that for sake of administrative ease in terms of the body, but essentially they all started at just about the same time and started fresh. And that is what my intent was here. But you're asking something different, I believe. You're saying that the body that's there now uh, under a different name <laughs> should continue until the new body under the new name is, is appointed. And didn't we go through this last time and Aren't they? That we extended it, right? Correct. So, Mr. Chairman, we are extended by the general default provisions of the BCC for six months, and then that six months terminates, and that termination date, I believe, is January thirty-first. That's correct. Right. So, if if we can't, my goal is that this be straightened out way before that, Splendid. because we're going to go. That's my goal. That doesn't mean it happens. That that uh, that we go on recess, you know, in mid, in early December, mid December. So my goal is that this be completed way before that. If not, then we certainly would need to extend or yeah. whatever we need to do. But but yeah. our goal is that you stay in existence until we can get the new body. In I'm, I'm suggesting that the council probably wants us to stay in existence, that they don't want a hiatus, and that I'm noting that you'll have the passage of the legislation, you'll have the advertising for positions, you'll have the process of of the interview process, however you set it up to be, you'll have the, the, the deliberations upon who you have. All of that is going to stretch out as it, yeah. as it stretched out in 2019 and 2020. I think, yeah, that there wouldn't be a gap, right? Uh, that, I think that's the point you're making, that we, there I'm, shouldn't be a gap, which I, I wholeheartedly agree on. I also know we're very interested in moving this along and making sure we do what we need to do. You're right, life happens, and sometimes things don't always happen on quite the time frame we expect, and I get that, but, um, you know, I think we're committed to But to you raised forward. another interesting point. I was going to say you raised an interesting point. You raised a few others, too, today. This is not an expedited bill. So once it's approved, and I'm thinking in the positive here, but once this is approved, it doesn't go into effect for 90 days, right? That's correct. Thank so should we suggest that this be an expedited bill so that it can go into effect the day it's signed? There will still be process as far as advertising for well, you know, vacant that, that seats. part is fine. And that'll I'm, take a while. Yeah, so. but okay. but at least the bill would be yeah. it would be in effect rather than us right. have to wait ninety days to advertise. No, that's true. I just right. correct, and and if that's the consensus, then that would be an amendment as well because that, yeah, let's I, go I'm, ahead and do that. Well, it, that's an amendment. Yeah. And then. Can I? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think that that makes sense. We want to try to make sure that we don't bump up against that. But I think it also makes sense just as a backstop to make sure that if we can have in there the language that it sounds like the idea is, is supported by everyone to make sure that we don't have a gap by saying that, um, you know, if the term limit, run, that, you know, we're going to keep folks in their seats until their replacement. If we could add that also, and hopefully we won't run into that. We want to try to get this done yeah. expeditiously. But I think it makes sense just, to, well, as long as we're in here, 
just to get that line in there to make sure. I thought sure. that's in the general board's committees and commissions language, generally speaking. But generally speaking, wrong. it is. I would like. To, I'm now. It's something I'd like to go back and look at because yeah. the the yeah. it says you just know you shall check. not you shall not serve any more than six months unless you know there's some. I just want to make sure that we. We're meeting whatever requirements we, we are there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, are we clear you. on the on the intent up here then that we want to make sure that they're able yes. to serve until their replacement has been uh, yeah. appointed? Yeah. Yes. Correct. Great. Yeah. Um, first off, thank you all very very much for what you do and for being here today. And, and at, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Farag and uh, and all, uh, Ms. Sacconi. Sacconi. Yes. There you go. I. I, for some reason, uh, am embarrassed about that, that I can't get that name right. Um, but I do thank you for all of your hard work. This is not easy. This was uh, major discussions. Uh, everybody wanted to do the right thing. It's just, in, as Ms. Branson said, everybody had a different definition of what the right thing was, I guess, through various times. And uh, we've, we're going to get through it, and, and I appreciate that. So with that, and I know everybody wants to hang around here, but but we're going to uh, adjourn, but the Public Safety Committee is coming back at 1.30. I, yeah. I just want to clarify, is this is is that a vote to move it to council with the amendments and clarifications yes. as opposed to a new, a next, no, another no, work no. session? Yeah. No, no, we're good. That, okay. That's a 3-0. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank we're adjourned. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Come you back. council members. We have another joint committee meeting. We're doing not as many uh, 